Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the, philo the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash aksum or aksum.substack.com or even join the YouTube channel directly at even $1 a month. Today, our special guest is Richard Rowland. Hello, guten tag, Richard. <laughs> Thank you uh, for having me on. My pleasure. There are a million topics uh, we can talk about and hopefully we'll hit something uh, close to a million. But I want to so start good. off on a note that I think have, has not been covered by other podcasts. You'll correct me if I'm wrong there. Okay. And I'd love for you to talk about uh, whatever your earliest martial arts experiences were and then to bring it to jujitsu. Yeah. So earliest martial arts experiences, um, I did some Taekwondo when I was a little kid. Uh, that's probably the earliest thing. Um, you know, put on the white gi and, you know, horse stance, star blocks, all that stuff. And, yep. And uh, then after that, I got really into uh, HEMA, so Historical European Martial Arts, uh, specifically Fiore Longsword, and then also um, Filipino Martial Arts. So, uh, uh, you know, Kali or Arnis or whatever, or, you know, Screamo, whatever you want to call it. It's got a bunch of different names and they're all more or less, more or less the same thing. Don't at me. You bunch <laughs> of Filipino dweebs out there. Uh, not actual Filipinos, just people who are really into it. Um, I actually really love and admire uh, Filipino martial arts even, even now. And, uh, uh, I did a, I was with a group that did a lot of full contact, uh, stick fighting. Nice. Um, uh, which I really loved, and and basically, uh, my favorite martial art is anything that you can do full contact. Right? Really, yes. it's this is this is basically there are two kinds of martial arts. It's not really traditional versus modern because there's nothing more ancient than wrestling, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's it's things that are theoretical and then things that are you can actually apply, and that, that that's that's really the difference. Uh, along the lines of theoretical things, you know, I did some Krav Maga actually twice, uh, two different times in my life. Um, uh, and then also a lot of, I mean, technically this is a martial art, uh, did a lot of, uh, firearms training in my life. Um, I actually taught, uh, for quite some time, but, uh, did wow. some, did some, some defensive pistol championships. So like a lot of running around and shooting and, um, yeah, so. Uh, that kind of brings me up to, um, once I had kids, it became harder and harder to do these sorts of things. Okay. And, uh, so, but these were continuous throughout your life. You didn't have any like long breaks. So the longest break was probably from right at, right around the time my second daughter was born, uh, uh, until uh, about two years ago. So probably about a seven or eight year gap actually. Uh, where I wasn't doing anything other than shooting. Mm -hmm. um, um, still loved the martial arts, still watched UFC, things like that, but uh, wasn't really practicing myself. Um, and then, oh, I, I did some boxing in there as well, um, way back in the day. Way back West, in the day. Western boxing or Thai yeah, boxing? Yeah, Western boxing. Um, Thai boxing is one that's always kind of uh, eluded me, uh, not for lack of a desire, and I hope to get around to it one of these days. But anyway, so... Um, and then back in, back about two years ago, I wanted to get the kids started in the martial arts. And so we started them at, at a place, uh, uh, started two of our kids at a place just down the road from us, uh, that has a pretty good kids program. And it's, it's pretty well-rounded. Like it's, it's like some self-defense kind of stuff and some kata and some jujitsu and some, uh, you know some weapons and anyway it's just like a really broad thing they call it karate but it's really they don't actually do any karate katas and so <laughs> uh and most of the you know it's it's basically it's like really jujitsu plus kickboxing plus like a couple other things anyway it's been pretty good for them um they have a good kids program there and they had an adult program there and i was like hey you know i this is something i really enjoyed and so um started it up again and did stuff there for uh, did stuff there for probably uh, all in all about a year. And then after I'd been there for about two months, we did some, uh, there was like a, uh, one one night where we were working on like ground fighting. It was mount escapes. And I mm -hmm. could not escape mount. And I was deeply frustrated by that fact. And I didn't feel like, you know, like 
you know, they, they spent like maybe 10 minutes on it and then they moved on to the next thing. I was like, no, no, no this seems like a big deal. <laughs> like if somebody's on top of me, I would like to get them off. And I've yeah. done, I done um, you know, some some kickboxing, uh, like amateur kickboxing, um, uh, uh, like uh, uh, tournaments and things like that. Wow. So, so like, like pretty, actual bouts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'm, you know, pretty comfortable fighting. I mean, I'm uh, just for the internet because people are always surprised when they meet me in person. Um, so I'm six foot four um and usually ray, weigh way right around 215 220 nice my walking around weight and i've cut weight down before to, to down to like 208 yeah uh, which is which is like the uh it's the heavyweight division in ibjjf but it's light heavyweight mm -hmm. pretty much everywhere else but anyway yeah, um, we're the, but same, I, we're anyway, the same weight i'm a little shorter than you i'm six yeah, one yeah. the same okay, weight yeah. right now yeah so anyway i'm a pretty big guy and i have long arms and like mm -hmm. punching things has never been hard for me <laughs> um but uh but you know it's like man if somebody's on top of me and i can't get them off i mean that seems like a problem we should spend more time on this and so i'd already kind of been think wanting to look at jujitsu anyway um because i really you know always admired it i guess um and so i i just uh i did a little research and i found a place near me that had a 6 a.m class yeah um and i was like cool well i can do this in the mornings and i can do this other thing in the evenings so I started doing that, and then after about a year of doing both, I just dropped the one place because uh, I kind of felt like I got to the end of uh, what they could teach, and mm -hmm. um, and they, they they didn't really have the anyway. So so anyway, I just so so now I just do jujitsu right now, um, um, primarily at six a.m. Um, and uh, done a few competitions, but uh, unfortunately, most competitions in my area are on Sundays, which is kind of a non-starter so um yes so if if a saturday competition comes up i'll do it um other but otherwise otherwise it's just more of a more of a hobby right now so and over time that's fantastic and uh, it's so funny like um you see these kind of non-specialist organizations it was and one of my old roommates he had this thing where if he saw like a restaurant that had too many things on their menu he would not want to eat there oh nice. and so yeah yeah so yeah. it's kind of it's kind of an interesting like you yeah think of the simplicity of an in and out or a google in terms of like their yeah. their user interface um it it, it does i mean you don't want to judge a book by its cover but sometimes <laughs> those uh those judgments uh, turn out to be accurate but it's good that you stuck it through and kind of uh tested it that way and even it's funny to have the label karate but to do other things yeah. i think that's kind of a, a market response a lot of places had over time i look at where i used to do taekwondo as a kid uh, and i did it up to like brown stripe for five and a half years in the san fernando valley i go back and over time they added brazilian jiu-jitsu and then over time they added mma as well yeah. and it, it's obviously like a thing they're doing to respond to right. the market and then you see um uh, i don't know if you're you used the word dweeb earlier um there's an anime called Jujitsu Kaisen, which has nothing to do with Jujitsu. It's this right. like, you know, fantasy based anime yep. about spirits. There's this Nicolas Cage movie about called Jujitsu. Right. Has nothing, nothing to do with, with Jujitsu. Jiu no, I didn't know about the Nicolas Cage movie. Yeah. Um, this so this place they called their they call their kids program karate uh -huh. and their adult program Krav Maga. Um, although although it's got no real relation to like Israeli you know yeah. combatives or whatever and, system, yeah and i i don't tend to like combative systems anyway because they tend to be like i think they're good at taking somebody from off the street and saying well we've got six weeks to teach you to be yes. aggressive and that's that's really all they're good for once you get past that first six weeks of now i know how to be aggressive it's just you know very repetitious uh not not in a cool way um but I mean, I, I don't have anything bad to say about the people there. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. one of one of their main uh, instructors was also like a, a Hicks and Gracie purple belt. Nice. So he's a pretty, you know, like pretty good grappler. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, in addition to being like a second degree black belt and in, in the other thing. So anyway, it was a fine place. But you know, for me, it was kind of two things. One is when I started, like, you know, uh, we we do like a a a, a a drill where you're like supposed to scramble for like the the training knife right mm -hmm. and so then you know I, so i scrambled for the the training knife and i'd wind up on the instructor's back you know strangling them <laughs> and <laughs> they were like you're supposed to control the knife i was like i was controlling you you know it's you know but anyway so it's just kind of things like that it was like when when i got to a point where where it's like okay i'm i'm kind of like beating these these other people in the drills and uh there's not enough i mean they do do uh uh, they do do like kind of like 50% or so contact sparring on the feet. 
and then like occasionally you get to roll but but maybe like if you were lucky like once a week or something like that and i was just like the thing that i really enjoy actually is, is sparring and i can spar all the time at yes. jujitsu and so it so that so for, so for me it was just kind of like you know one i, I felt like i'd kind of got to the end of what what i what i was seeing as like this is useful and street effective versus mm -hmm. this is stuff that we have to teach because we're part of this company that does karate and so now you've got to learn this this kata what's this kata have to do with anything anything that you might actually do deal with on the streets N not a lot actually so so it was like kind of at the end of what they were teaching but also uh i was just having more fun at the other place so that's yeah. You know, and that's, that's your right, and everyone's got limited time. So I'm I'm glad you tried it, but then you found what was better. Yeah, I I feel the same way. In fact, you were speaking to my Semitic heart when you were mm. talking about this difference between theory and practice, and it's, yeah, it's like yeah, some yeah. people still have their preconceived notions of and, and dogmas within martial arts, which you know Bruce Lee got us started on getting away from, and I think Joe Rogan has also popularized people, just use what works. People came in right after Bruce Lee and immediately like dogmatized. Mm -hmm. a bunch of things like in a way uh that you know obviously i am a fan of dogma in certain yes. circumstances but like <laughs> but basically like fossilized would be a better word right they mm -hmm. they like immediately like one generation after lee all his protégés and their students almost immediately just like fossilized his stuff and yeah. as though well he's done it nobody's ever going to make any improvements on this and so like this is the thing now uh which it, which again is wild because lee you know, first of all, it didn't know how to wrestle, which is the which is the oldest martial art. Yes. Right. Way more ancient than, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen some of these videos where people are like breaking down even like old Kung Fu forms and being like, these are actually wrestling moves. Yeah. Yeah. Old, old Kung Fu, old Karate, old Taekwondo. They all yeah. had them and they kind of slowly got rid of them. Yeah. Even Judo has been kind of weeding out a lot of its moves throughout the 20th century. Yeah. For various uh, poor incentives, in, yep. in, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it, obviously we like church dogma, but yeah, fossilized it. Or yeah. the, another way that I would say it, and actually we'll, we'll talk about this more when we come back to Ethiopia maybe, but one of the kind of big critiques I have about like my Ethiopian society is we valorize the kind of individualist pioneer but then like after the pioneer has done something there's like a lot of lack of critical thinking so yeah. it's almost like you kind of need a pioneer every generation or every other um generation or so and one of those big kind of arguments debates that i i think is winning on one particular side but i wouldn't fully go in either direction i'd love to hear your thoughts on is this debate about the gi or the kimono versus no mm. gi? what what are, what are your thoughts on training and competing in in those so at my gym right now um I'm basically doing no gi two thirds of the time and gi a third of the time, mm -hmm. and then when the weather turns cold, we'll switch that. Nice. Um, so my my coach and my coach is uh, I mean he's a serious dude. He just won uh, Dallas ADCC. Um, nice. Very very serious competitor, um, freak athlete as well. Um, uh, he's awful to roll with in no gi. He's even worse in gi. Um, <laughs> but you know the way he put it is, you know, if you're going to do jujitsu, you just, you really do have to know both. Um, I think that the gi is contrary to what a lot of people will say when they're just like saying things without thinking about them critically. I think the gi is probably a little more practical for self-defense purposes. Interesting. Because everybody wears clothes. Um, now, you know, actually where I live, where it's really hot all the time. Yeah. Um, it, you know, the, the the chances you might have to fight somebody in shorts in a t-shirt and a in a t-shirt are are elevated and so in that sense maybe nogi is like a little more practical but i i think for most people in most places uh -huh. um i think that the gi is a little more uh uh let's say practical for self-defense purposes and i think a good proof of this is is judo actually uh, which i'm a huge fan of um and i do i mess around with a little bit of judo i have a, a friend who's a pretty high level judoka and uh there's a there's a pretty cool kosen judo place oh, not, nice. too, not, not too far from where i live and they have like a friday night fight night and yeah. you can just go it's just like a big open mat and you can do judo rounds you can do uh you can do just as long as the other person agrees like you can do jujitsu rounds mm -hmm. things like that um um 
Uh, actually, doing jujitsu rounds with judo people is really fun because usually they'll throw me, but then I'll end up submitting them. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, but yeah. uh, but then you know if they throw me on concrete, you know, maybe maybe a different picture. So anyway, I have a lot of respect for judo, and uh, you can you can find plenty of plenty of videos uh, where people, you know, uh, where somebody like you know a self defense situation, somebody judo throws somebody into the pavement. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I I think the gi is is pretty practical for self-defense purposes. I think that if you're just looking at self-defense and you find kind of an older school place that's like gi intensive and they're just, you know, like fine, you're, you're, you're gonna, uh, a, it's going to be good for your health. Um, which is like, m you know, you're much more likely to die of like heart disease than you are of <laughs> being in the street. So anything that gets you moving your body is probably good in that sense. Right. Amen. Um, and then, and then also again, just the fact that you're doing full contact sparring, uh it's almost like if if you're talking about for self defense like almost anything that subjects you to real pressure is going to be effective in my opinion and so like i i to a certain extent, i don't actually care like if you're a muay thai guy or you wrestle or you box or you do jiu jitsu or or judo as long as you're doing something full contact on a regular basis you're probably way ahead of the curve now Agreed. i like jiu jitsu for a lot of reasons um i think it's it like it's just a beautiful art form to me. Mm -hmm. um, I like. Um, I just. I just like it. I like it. You know. But. Um, but if you like something else better, as long as it's like a serious full contact kind of a thing, or or you at least have the you know the the potential to to train full contact on a regular basis, um, not just you know like yelling blah 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 as you you know uh, air air elbow like you know the the you know the space in front of somebody's groin six times yeah you know looking at you crowd guys um uh the you know dojos yeah yep yeah, right so as long as that you're not doing that like as long as you're doing something that's that's got you know that because the biggest thing is like you need to be put in bad situations on a regular basis so you get to where you're just sort of calm you know in dealing with the situations and you can get that gi no gi now that said um i Obviously, no gi is like the hot. This there's a hot thing right now. I I stayed up way too late last night, uh, which was terrible because I had to get up at five this morning to train. But I stayed up way too late last night watching the uh, the UFC uh, Fight Pass invitation. Oh, I haven't seen it yet, but I've seen the highlights and comments. Yeah, yeah. so it was very good. Um, lots of very high level technical grappling. Um, you know, I think the EBI rule set is fun. I don't. I don't think anything... I was going to ask you about that because a lot of high level people yeah. complain about it. Just for people who don't know, there's a certain time limit where it's supposed to be submission only without points. Right. And then in order to abolish judges, which I think right. is a great value, yeah. you start off from a dangerous position in overtime. Right. right. So so this is the thing, because then you get guys like the B team guys who I love because they're hilarious and, and very fun to watch. And they put just like free rolling footage like every single day on their YouTube channel. Yes. Um, I, I very often I'll sit here working and I'll just have B team, you know, rolling footage going in the background. I'm like, I'm going to try that. Um, not not that, you know, like my level of technical, you know, I, so uh, I've been doing jujitsu for about 20, 21 months now. Nice. Um, so like enough time to like know things but also not so much time that i'm actually good at it you know like you know gets another white belt you yeah know, um i've got you know for people who like stripes i've got four of them uh you know probably you're on the cusp get, yeah probably gonna get a blue belt at some point um but uh but yeah the 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 you know so so anyway but but i love watching it um i think it's it but yeah so the ebi rules were basically it was basically a rule set intended among other things but like primarily to make it uh competitive jujitsu more fun to watch yes um so it does that i think pretty effectively now the flip side is that if you've got very high level guys uh who really train for the rule set what they will basically do is train to stall slash survive yeah. the regulation round and then basically just focus on getting really really good at back escapes, back control, armbar escapes, and arm bars, right? And then, and so then they plan to win in overtime. So that's how Nicky Rod won all three of his matches. Was yes. uh, now he did, to his credit, he he didn't write he didn't win on ride time. He he got submissions all three. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but but basically, like, and and actually, he started out in um, like he lost a coin toss, a coin toss for all three. So in all three, like he explosively escaped back control in like five seconds, and then you know, submitted the guy when it was his turn, right? So like 
that is obviously that's an amazing skill, right? Yeah. Um, so, but it does mean that the uh, that the it does mean that the regulation rounds can be potentially like a little boring to watch. I don't know what to do about that. Like, there's no mm -hmm. rule set because if you do like uh, no time limit submission only, uh, which it, which would be like the purest version, yes. right, of jujitsu. But then you have the potential of watching a 30, 40, 45 minute hour long match yeah. where nothing happens most of the time until somebody gets gassed. Yeah. Right. And so um, I, I, I don't know if you watch a lot of one uh, championship stuff. I, not a lot, but I do. I do watch some. I, I would support like in general and we can talk about it combat jujitsu as a rule set and i support Ed eddie bravos because for me the ideal of jujitsu is yeah. vale tudo it's for the real fight yeah. and the issue is that you have this counterbalance between trying to make the fight as realistic as possible but also trying to protect the fighters so that they could continue to do this like right. you talked about this practice or this training which yeah. separates from the theoretical martial arts which is important but you know the founder of judo uh kano jigoro was very adamant about also trying to make it as safe as possible. Yep. And you don't want to get too much into safetyism, which is what I think the kind of judo yep. overlord tribunals have been doing in the 20th and 21st yep. centuries in getting rid of leg takedowns and getting rid of yeah, like yeah, Kani yeah. Basami and uh, other other yeah. takedown maneuvers. But I think it's it's that I think combat jujitsu, which is basically you're not allowed to strike on your feet, but you can slap them from the ground is important. Yep. Just just last week I was submitted by an achilles lock for example and i'll tell right, you yeah. before i was submitted by the lock if it was a real fight i had my full free leg that i would have kicked the person in the, in the face, face. Yeah, yeah it would have been over right there yeah, additionally yeah. even let's say i don't have soccer kicks available to me i had two hands while they had two hands on my foot i could have held their one hand and either punched hammer fisted or slapped them in the face and yeah. the achilles lock would have been gone i could still be got in an achilles lock but it, it 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 it's lacking a certain um realism and that and the butt scooting is some there are two things that i'm very against which is why i like the idea that if you're on your butt scooting towards someone or scuffling and shuffling you should be slapped in the face and yeah. uh, some of the early gracies actually did that you mentioned hicks and gracie my first year and a half of jujitsu i was at his former gym which his son crone took over and um we we didn't have slaps but i you hear stories that that people used yeah. to do that like in their backyards and yeah. stuff i think i i really like combat jujitsu like it's fun to watch i think it's a cool rule set um no i agree i think i think that if you could normalize that as the as the um you know in some sense it's like less uh no that's not the right way to say that um yeah, no, I, I, I think if we could normalize normalize that, which would basically mean all the top jujitsu athletes would need to start, you know, doing it and taking it seriously. But, um, but I, I, I think it's cool. I mean, that with, with something like an Achilles lock, you know, how how useful, effective of a submission is that in the real world? It's very easy to just go look at the stats in MMA. How often are people submitted by an Achilles lock? Almost never. Um, I'm sure it's happened once or twice, um, but you know what are the highest percentage submissions right rear naked choke right yes rear naked arm choke bar, arm bar right Shimura. yeah these things uh, those things you know especially like the rear naked choke always works you know no matter how tough or strong somebody is right you know um but um and that's my that's my favorite anything like even you know this morning like um is always i'm always looking to get to the back same you know, get to the back you can't hit me you can't you know yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, one, one, one championship has been doing, um, actually I think so low key, if you're into martial arts, one is actually the best promotion to watch, mm -hmm. um, for a few different reasons. One is they put a ton of stuff out just for free. Like every Friday yes. they put stuff on YouTube. Um, their, their pay-per-view events are free to watch if you have Amazon prime, which like everyone does. Um, uh, but, what's cool about one is a couple of different things one is that they do mixed rule cards so yes. every card will have like a couple of mma things but then also you get like uh like dutch kickboxing and you get muay thai and four ounce gloves which is the most fun combat sport there is like in terms of what of, of like watchability 
is Muay Thai in four ounce gloves. For people who don't know, normally in Muay Thai, you have eight ounce gloves. And so they're like the big mittens. I've got a couple mm -hmm. around here somewhere in my office. Um, <laughs> uh, they're like the big mittens and uh, it makes it really easy to shell up and just kind of, kind of hide behind the gloves like in Western boxing. But uh, in Muay Thai with four ounce gloves, basically you use four ounce MMA gloves and uh, you can't really hide behind your hands. And man, oh man, is this stuff fun to watch. Um, yes. And they basically have like all the best Muay Thai fighters in the world under their banner right now. Um, so massive, massive fan of that. And then, but then they also have MMA um, and some very good MMA fighters. I mean, Demetrius Johnson is, you know, maybe one of the greatest of all time. Um, well, certainly one of the greatest of all time, maybe the greatest of all time. But anyway, he's great. Um, you know, they have Renier de Ritter and, and, you know, other guys like that. So like, they've got some good MMA talent, but then they also have a, a submission grappling championship. Yes. And so their rule set is pretty good. It does have judges, but basically it's based on, uh, uh, if, so you have a time limit, I think it's 10 minutes, no rounds, just a 10 minute. And during that 10 minutes, you are, uh, it's submission only. And if nobody gets a submission, then it's the person who had the largest number of catches um and but basically the more catches you get or the you know if you get an actual submission you get paid more so fighters are incentivized to go in and it's still like no gi submission grappling but they're incentivized to go in and do um and get uh uh to get you know as as, as many submission holds as possible right and so the ref is standing by and basically when the ref thinks okay that's a legit submission attempt right even if like you go for the arm bar you get it but the guy manages to escape which nikki rod had an insane arm bar escape last night i saw that i saw it that scary stuff he's um, doing he's doing a seminar on his roddy lock which he definitely lifted from dana Hare's body lock system oh yeah for in sure. uh in redlands california in the yeah. inland empire so yeah i might have to peek my head in yeah oh that'd be that dude that'd be rad <laughs> um but yeah so anyway he um uh uh so so the ref is watching and the ref will call catches when he sees them so yes so like if, and 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 then basically the person who wins is the person who got the most like you know potentially valid submission holds if if nobody actually gets submitted um and they've had great matches like there's not a single one of those matches that is boring to watch um which it which i think is like that's the big thing uh that's been ruining sport judo is they're trying to make it more interesting to watch primarily right because they're trying to turn it more into a spectator sport. Um, and so, you know, this gets you what with like some insane rules about like how long you can only actually hold somebody's key for mm -hmm. like two or three seconds now or whatever. I, I don't remember, but the, the exact rule, but it's just, um, now something I would like to see, honestly, I would love to see combat jujitsu with the gi. That'd um, be interesting. I think that would be very revealing. I think it would open yes. up a lot of like, you know, because there's so many like grips in the gi and things like this, but then how, uh, a, how well does that work if you're being hit in the face? But then two, like the, the other big question that I would have about that would be um, like, it's so much easier to control people's arms and hands in the gi. Like, mm -hmm. so what does that tell us about, you know, a, a street fight in terms of your, your capability? Somebody's wearing long sleeves, somebody has a jacket on, your ability to control their hands and use their body and, and whatnot. So, um, and I, I will say, I've actually done a little bit of this. Um, Oh yeah, uh, like with, with uh, street clothes. Uh, with, with a friend of mine who's a purple belt, uh, we've done like some combat jujitsu round, uh, rounds in the oh, game. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I was gonna yeah. ask if you have that at your gym or anything. Yeah, no, no, we not officially. No. Okay. No, okay. No, not not officially. I mean, it's it's pretty high level sport jujitsu, but it's it's sport jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know that said, so, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to get in a fight with any any of those guys. No, so in yeah. in Torrance, California, which is the home of uh, jujitsu in the United States, mm -hmm. was uh, you know I'm a little bit of a creonche, if you know that Portuguese word, the trader, the gym trader. Oh uh, no, <laughs> because I, only because I've moved a lot, so I've had to switch. How long games. have you been? How long have you been doing jujitsu? So uh, mine is very uh, crazy. I have been doing it since 2017 i was oh, nice. about 26 on the cusp of 27 and so that uh, you would want to say five years at least that i've been actively thinking about it because watching film like you said definitely contributes to the knowledge but my actual mat time in a gym is like three years right. and it was split because of the pandemic so it's like a year and a half before the pandemic and Got a year it. and a half Got after it. the pandemic and then um before i started again 
like fully at a gym after the pandemic. I grabbed some friends who had only like WWE children's wrestling experience. Yeah, 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 and yeah. Then we made a home garage and I was training them from scratch oh, one, one day a week. Nice. So I, like, if you don't count that or count that, that would give me like one more year or something. Yeah, yeah, experience. yeah. But like okay. actual mat time with higher belts is like three years. So you're and, a blue belt? Uh, I'm a blue belt. I'm yeah. a very low skilled blue belt. I'm a low, low tier blue belt. Um, so so uh, yeah, there's that. And um, I, I I think the the one stuff is is really great. But at my gym in in Torrance, and I'll just briefly on the one stuff, they also have the addition of the cage where yeah. other places don't have the cage, which brings totally. in fence wrestling, which is a yeah. different dynamic, which is it's yeah. interesting to train both, like we said with Gi and Nogi. Yep. But in Torrance at the main what's called Gracie University right now, it used to be called the Gracie Academy with Hiron and Henner, who's uh Hiron cleaned up the blood at the first UFC when he was 12 years old. Yeah, His yeah, father yeah. Horion owned it, co-owned it for the first five when it had uh, in my opinion, much greater rule sets, no wraps, no gloves, and unlimited uh, uh, rounds. But at that gym, because they have this history, uh, first of all, when the main like black belt professors roll, even when it's no gi, they don't take their uh, gi off. Oh, nice. <laughs> they still wear their gi, and they'll go against you no gi. Yeah, yeah. Is, it's always I loved. And then even uh, there are two days a week, and it, it switches every season. One day is no gi plus gloves, and the other day is gi plus gloves. Nice. And the difference is we're not like an MMA gym trying to knock you out. But the way they describe it is they say, you remind people that the position that they're in is artificial or not real. Yeah, so yeah. if someone's there, you give them a light tap in the face. You're not trying to KO them. Because I'm, I'm, I'm at an MMA gym now. And I'll tell you, uh, a Muay Thai fighter the other day, I was like, yo, let's do an MMA round. And he was trying to take my head off. He got me with a good hook. And I was foolishly without... Um, my headgear and without my mouth guard yep. but uh after i felt that i caught a kick took him down and mounted him so uh to your earlier point the mount is a great position to learn and i think yep. it's good to to vary things have a cage have no cage have a gi have no gi have a gi and gloves or um my professor would go against us in gloves with his gi he'd have no gloves and he would just slap us and right. even i've seen him like leave welts on some purple yeah. belts who are who have the ability to punch them with gloves which even protects your hands and he's just slapping them from different positions yeah so you were so you were at that gym and now you're at the mma gym now i'm at an mma gym yeah oh, with cool. roosevelt roberts if you've seen him he's the guy who got the quick knockout uh on uh, team chandler against uh mcgregor oh, really? you know, mcgregor's team has lost everything i haven't been watching tough because i can't stand what McGregor has morphed into, but, uh, yeah. but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's really cool though. Um, yeah, I, I, I would love for, um, uh, uh, MMA gyms to become like as ubiquitous as like jujitsu has become. Um, I mean, I really love jujitsu. If there was a, uh, an MMA gym that was similarly close and also had a 6am class, I'd probably switch. Um, um, the the because i've enjoyed the mma rounds that i've done and uh you know got a strong like kickboxing background um but yes. yeah i was yeah. going to ask you if you've ever put the two together because it sounds like you've done an incredible amount of striking and grappling in isolation and then with your boy you put in a little bit of the element of striking but outside of that uh combat jiu jitsu practice with the gi you hadn't really put the two striking and grappling together um no, I've never, never in a formal setting. Like I've done some things messing around with friends, like after afterwards on the mat and stuff like that. But I've never, uh, I've never gotten to string the two together in a in a like a formal setting. Um, yeah, it's funny because if you go to a kickboxing place, they're like, no, none of that grappling stuff here. You know, they're, they're scared of that. And then like the same thing when I showed up, when I showed up. Uh, so I'll tell you about my first day doing jujitsu. Mm -hmm. um, so I show up with uh, no grappling experience, uh, really to speak of um uh and we you know so i'm in like a t-shirt and t-shirt and basketball shorts you know i don't have a gi and i don't have grappling shorts or a, a rash guard or any anything like that right um so i'm just there in like a t-shirt and basketball shorts and we're we're going through things and ju they just happen that day like it's not the 6 a.m class is not really a beginner class mm -hmm. um actually the the dudes at the 6 a.m class are just like you know like out for murder it's like <laughs> it's like we're it's like everyone's joking around uh during drills because it's like early in the morning and our brains aren't really awake but then when it's time to roll 
uh, we're just like, yeah, you know, you know, screw that guy. Take his wallet. You know, just like, just like, uh, it's great. I love it. It's but but everybody is like a hundred percent, like all the time in that class, um, which I enjoy. Um, but they they do have like beginner classes in the evenings and things like that. But at the time, I mean, it was a really new gym. I I I, I started there like two or three months after they opened. Um, so, so at the time, you know, anyway, there was no beginner class, but they were doing a beginner sequence that day just cause it was the thing in the rotation, which happened to be the good old arm bar, arm bar to triangle to omoplata. Right. Nice. So that was the very first like sequence of jujitsu moves I, I learned. Um, and, uh, and, actually still don't use them very much. I'm, I'm much more of like a sweep and get on top kind of a guy, but, um, uh, but but yeah anyway so that was that was where i started um and then after it was over like after drills were over and you know we always roll for uh we do four to five rounds uh every more every morning and um the coach is like all right so we're gonna roll now and he looks at me and i was like i have no idea uh what the rules are here and i said you know it's like so we're gonna spar have you ever done anything like this it's like i've done a lot of kickboxing he's like don't kick anybody <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, but yeah, so so uh, we're rolling and I get paired for the first round with this guy. It's also his first day. This dude wrestled in high school. Mm -hmm. He's a bit younger than me uh, as well. So, you know, like very young, athletic, wrestled in high school. Um, I was pretty I was coming off of lots of years sitting at a desk and so it was a lot flabbier then. Uh, and and uh, so I was just like, OK, well, so obviously, you know, we, we slap bump and he immediately double legs me like you know goes right for it and without any idea of what i'm doing he doesn't know what he's doing i don't know what i'm doing um i just wrap my arm around his neck and i wrap my legs around his body and i just squeeze yeah and he tapped out wow it's just so it was a guillotine but i mean like i knew what a guillotine was from watching one but like it was just instinct here's a head but he didn't know because he'd come from wrestling like he just didn't know don't put your head there Mm -hmm. jujitsu because somebody will, will strangle you but anyway that was my that was my very first round um and, and you know you've been doing this long enough to be aware of like the incredible attrition rate in jujitsu yes um other martial arts are this way a little bit obviously just because it's like for most people it's an extracurricular activity it costs time and money um but but like there's like jujitsu has a way of like sort of grinding down like anybody who is there for the wrong reason they just won't stick around it's too it's too yeah. hard um so unfortunately, that guy, uh, like a lot of the guys that were, you know, that 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 have started since I started, aren't there anymore, you know. But um, yeah, anyway, it's, uh, but it's been good, and you know, I do have some some like pretty longer term training partners, um, and uh, and that's I'm really grateful for that. You know, it, it's at the end of the day, obviously, it's sort of a meme like on Reddit, Jujitsu changed my life, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But um. I, I think it's very fun and it's a good way to make friends and it's a good way to exercise. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Craig Jones, uh, in my opinion, King of the B team, at least in humor was recently sure. making a video poking fun of that Reddit tier idea and was actually saying jujitsu probably ruined more lives than it saved. <laughs> like <laughs> he's so funny, but yeah, to the attrition rate thing, it's actually the perfect segue to the question that I was going to ask you. And it's so funny yeah. because I wanted to see how long, can we scare our audience away by just talking about oh, jujitsu jiu <laughs> forever? <laughs> and I was like, and how long can we keep this going? They, they've seen our work and they're not expecting it. And that's what I like to do. I, yeah. I had brought a, a Canadian journalist on not too long ago and, and spoke like similarly long with him about uh, karate do because he was a, a, a karate oh, yeah. uh, player. Um, but I like what I want to ask you is this thing I see. Um, with the, because you and I are public thinkers, and what I see with the kind of intellectual class in the United States is that uh, I think they are really well or really good at like not being totally obese, although some of them are. And the way that they typically like combat that when you're talking about jujitsu as a, a health longevity tool is by running, and especially like running long distance or in mm. general like cardio. However, when it comes to something like, especially the striking, but even jujitsu, for those who don't know and understand it, it comes and uh, off and seems very brutal and primitive to them. 
However, what I think is going on with the attrition rate is that a lot of egos are being flattened because you have to be willing to lose and lose again and again and again in order to get better. And what's different about jujitsu versus like Western boxing or sprinting, and I picked this up from one of my favorite coaches for us as a hobby over there in Montreal, is uh, near our good friend Jonathan, is Mm -hmm. that uh jujitsu has not infinite but like millions of possibilities and so there's a way in which it's it's very similar many people have made the analogy that it's chess with your body and so it's a very intellectual complex than chess though agreed because because rather than being turn-based right right and this is uh maybe we'll talk about it when we talk about it's momentum based yes and it's live it's it's action it'd be chess if you can actively move (laughs) <laughs> right, it, it's momentum based, and and so a lot of times it's more like, let's say, like basketball in the sense that, uh, in jujitsu there's very much a sense of who has the ball right now. Yes. Right, and so like, do I have the the initiative? Because if I had the initiative, then I can like you only get further behind. Mm-hmm. Right. So the reason the reason that I lose to somebody who's much more experienced than me isn't usually because they're faster or stronger than me. It's usually because they're still they're they're already three moves ahead yes and i'm just reacting and every time i react 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 if i don't come up with a way of blade of breaking there in in uh in like uh handgun defense there's something that we call the ooda loop i don't know if you're familiar with this idea mm-hmm. the ooda loop basically it's just the the here's how it's it basically it's just your decision making loop and yes in a uh in a self-defense situation the most important thing to do is to break the other guy's decision making loop um so if you can turn the tables in some way like create an unexpected variable in the situation that's enough to like cause that other person to freeze out and then you can either execute uh, or or you can just get out of there or whatever but like this is the same thing in jujitsu like if i'm rolling with a brown belt and he's just you know like constantly attack 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 it's happened this morning right it's constantly <laughs> attack 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 well you know i'm defending this i'm defending this i'm defending this i'm defending this but eventually one of those gets through because i'm on the defensive and every time i react instead of take action i get like a little bit further behind so chess That's is true. more chess is more like chess is turn based but like in jujitsu you can just make it always your turn you know, and so in that sense, you know, and then, but obviously there are, you know, escapes, sweeps, things like this that are basically, I'm taking the ball back, right? Now I'm going to go on the offensive. Um, Ab- absolutely. So, yeah, and yeah. yeah, you're saying the textbook thing that Hicks and Gracie actually is famously quoted as saying, like he goes in his own jujitsu from A to B and B to C, never backwards, you know, yeah. he's he's got a forward progression yeah. uh, set of uh, movements there to... Um, I'll make a brief video game analogy and we'll co- we'll come back to the sure. the main question I have for you regarding brutality. Growing up, I played both turn-based video games and live video games both of which were RPGs. Did you have a preference between the two? Um like Final Fantasy for me yeah. is uh, it's Final Fantasy VII is like the typical kind of turn-based, but there were other ones yeah, that were made people, by Square Enix. For a lot of but people. then like live ones are like Diablo, and for yeah. me the Forgotten Realms series, like the the yeah. not the original Baldur's Gate, but like the Dark Alliance and later Champions of Norath. So I didn't play a lot of computer RPGs growing up. I did later um, as an adult, but um, it was mostly like analog gaming as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, now that said, I did play a lot of uh, like RTS, like real-time strategy kind of yes. based games and things like that. Um, like, like StarCraft? Whole, like uh, so much StarCraft. So much StarCraft. <laughs> Starting with a pirated CD that I got from a, a, a like my, my cousin, you know, like burned me a copy of his CD. Um, but uh, played a lot of StarCraft. Um, and then also like the Total War series of games, which co- sort of combines turn-based with, you know, real-time elements and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I don't know, like, uh, but most most of this, most of the gaming I did as as a kid would have been RTSs. Um, I did a couple of first person shooters, but as I was explaining to somebody this morning, a I'm just bad at them. I'm just mm-hmm. really bad at first person shooters. I don't I don't have that like sort of like the just the twitchiness. Yeah, and, and reaction time. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I have good reaction time in like other areas of my you know my life. It's never been a problem in, in other things, but like uh, just like something about I think just like being there at the screen and having like watch everything so intently. I just. Just, just can't do it. But um, 
but yeah, I, so, but like as far as computer RPGs, um, I really enjoyed the Elder Scroll games later on, uh, but I didn't get into those until I was an adult, so. That's fair, yeah. And, and going back to what you were saying, like what you're talking about, how you can take the ball back, your analogy, I loved it. To use a, another anime as an analogy, Hunter x Hunter, there's a villain called King, and he's famous for being this very powerful guy, but he would also love playing people in Go, which is a very mm. non nonviolent thing. And he would talk about disrupting the rhythm of the other person. And I think it originates from yeah. this judo idea called Kazushi, or unbalancing the opponent, which jujitsu has a lot of as well. Right. You don't go kind of too much in in either extreme. But the main question I wanted to ask you here is like, Okay, Richard, you're very well respected for your intellect and you're doing this very brutal thing. How do you explain to your smart audience who has some timidity regarding uh, things like martial arts? What What is your intellectualization or rationalization for why such a smart guy like you would do such a dangerous activity? Um, man, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, so on the one hand, I understand the argument against stuff like this. Like, uh, all, like most people are not really put off by jujitsu, um, mm -hmm. either because they don't really understand what it is, or they're just like, oh, that's a bunch of guys in geese and belts. That's kind of like karate. Karate is a thing that I know, you know, and you know, a, a lot of for a lot of people, like uh, martial arts is syn synonymous with like positive things, like self discipline and you know, self mastery and all this, all these things. But then like take that person and sit them down and show them like a UFC fight, you know, uh, take that person, sit them down and show them. I'm trying to think of like an, a special, Oh, that, uh, that Chandler, uh, that Chandler Gaethje fight from a couple yeah. of years ago. Right. Take them down, sit them down and be like, no, this is actually martial arts. And well, this is like, this is two like cavemen clubbing each other to death with their hands. Yeah. You know? And so like, well, isn't this kind of like, uh, uh, you know, it's brutal, it's, you know, gladiatorial sports, yes. it's, you know, think that's, that's the, that's the argument that I sometimes get from people. And like, on yeah. a certain sense, I get it. Like, on a certain sense, I get the, I get the, uh, shouldn't we have like evolved or like moved on from this by now <laughs> and things like this. And obviously, like, if somebody is, for instance, a monk, yes. right, and is, doesn't want to watch these sorts of things, like, I, I get that. And I respect it. And I would never try to like, force it on somebody that wasn't into it on the flip side um to me this is and i'll go back to wrestling um uh, wrestling and just like grappling in general right is is actually one of the major bases of human culture right every human culture as far as i know has a if you go back far enough has a traditional wrestling thing and they'll all have like different rules and they'll have different, maybe you have different things that you wear and you've got a belt mm -hmm. the other guy can grab, or you've got a jacket the other guy can grab or something like, but pretty much every human culture has the basic idea that men, and it's really just men, nothing against ladies doing martial arts. You know, my, I got my girls in the martial arts, but, but like, if you don't have a forum in which men can come together on the village green, contest with each other in a semi-violent fashion but nobody dies which is what is great about grappling right if you don't have that in your culture then you'll what you'll get will be roving gangs right um men have aggression and we have you know like you know bodies that are built to fight things to protect things if you don't have i'm not not even like so much an outlet, but like if you don't have a focus, right? If you don't have a focus, if you don't have a purpose for that kind of activity, then uh, you really start to sort of uh, develop some really disturbing pathologies as a as a society. Now, where does this where does where does this cross the line into? This? Now, when you take this and you make it a spectator sport, right? So that's where you're that's where you have to be a little careful about where does this cross the line into like decadence, right? Just mm -hmm. just you know, rich people sitting around watching people fight for fun, right? So where where does that become kind of problematic? Because on the on the one hand, something like mixed martial arts is the highest that's the highest level that we have available 
to see what this stuff looks like to see how it works like we have so much more data i mean this is why it's completely ludicrous to to take something like you know bruce lee's you know some things that he wrote down one time and like fossilize that as oh this is the pinnacle of all martial arts you know because we have so much more data now like what do you think bruce lee would be doing if 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 like he was born after ufc one you know um so this is the the so so the question is kind of where you tip over that line and sometimes um for me for me it's any time that it goes from being let's make this as fair a fight as possible so that we can just pit skill versus skill and we go from that to spectacle right so like freak show fights and man i'm a huge I was I was pride pride never die baby yes like I was I <laughs> happy, was such... happy pride month for the pride MMA promotion yeah that's right yeah when people say pride month I get really excited and then I'm like oh no you don't mean what I oh no okay <laughs> I didn't you didn't mean what I thought you meant dang it um um huge fan of pride FC but I think like uh Japanese the Japanese MMA scene for a very long time was definitely moving into this into this like more spectator kind of a thing actually I have a Remind me before the end, we'll come back around and talk about MMA rules because I have a proposal. Okay. But um, but just the, the idea like freak show fights, right? Basically, let's yeah. pit a giant against a midget, you know, that <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, that that kind of thing. Um, just like the freak show, the spectacle, uh, that sort of thing just sort of like fuels bloodlust, but doesn't also like give you something to aspire to. Like, yeah. I'll never be uh Charles Oliveira, right? Mm -hmm. But when I watch him fight, I'm like, dang, like, I, I'll never be able to do that, but somebody can do that. And that's the kind of thing that makes me want to train harder mm -hmm. and makes me aspire to be a better martial artist. Um, especially, you know, when you get that, you know, the rare combination of somebody who has a, a very high degree of skill, you know, they're the top of the game, but they're also just like a good person, respectful and, you know, right that that kind of person is makes everybody else better it makes the whole martial arts you know elevates it it's not the case that somebody who's a really skilled martial artist is also going to be a decent human being it just doesn't work that way we would like it to work that way and i think that mm -hmm. i think that uh being a martial artist especially if you're in a serious martial art uh has the capability to definitely will get rid of certain kinds of thing like unfounded ego right there's a reason that um, I can't tell you how many times I've I've run into somebody. Uh, oh, you do you know? I'm wearing a T-shirt uh, with Marsh like a, a you know my gym logo or something. And, oh, you do martial arts? Where do you train? I mean, to talk about this. Oh, I do Krav down at so and so place. And and you know uh, maybe I'll come check your thing out. Maybe I'll come to one of your open mats because we do jujitsu too. And those people never show up, right? <laughs> people never show up. Why? Because they've got this very pretty idea of well, if this happened, here's what I do. Yeah. Right. But then it's like, all right, well, come on over and I'll put you in the chokehold and then let's <laughs> let's see what happens, you know? Um and and uh but but if you're in a like like so serious martial arts can quash that kind of ego. There's also another kind of ego that comes from actually being very good at something, right? Which which martial arts will not help you with. Um uh now I'm in most of us are not in any danger of that because there's like so many people who are better at this than I am that like th it would just be ludicrous like for me to ever you know but for somebody at the very top of their game I mean this is why Connor can 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 like get you know some combination of like success and money and probably a lot of cocaine I'm just guessing <laughs> um, you know has has kind of made him into like a cartoon version of, of himself right and and um, but. And that kind of spectacle, and I think it's really where like just stupid amounts of money gets involved, right? That's, and I really do, you know, would like to see more equitable fighter fighter pay, but it's when you when you get like these these spectacle fights, stupid amounts of money involved, corruption involved, all those different things. Uh, but that's not the fault of martial arts. It's just another case where human greed, and uh, you know, the decadence of the society that we live in has kind of taken something that's good, uh, and then made it into a bad thing so you know as far as like but it, but as far as like violence itself like as far as as um um as far as like aggression and like physical conflict all sports all sports are abstract war 
right? And you can decide what level of abstractness you're comfortable with. Correct. But all sports are abstracted war. And the whole purpose of sports, if you read Plato, for instance, like who is a big fan of sports, um, Plato is probably just his wrestling nickname. Um, <laughs> it, means, it means like plate, it means like wide, right? And, yeah. and he, when he was, um, when he when he was a a, a a a young man, like he participated in you know basically the ancient Greek version of MMA, you know, mm -hmm. and which is like wrestling, yeah, pancreation. So like wrestling plus boxing, right? You know, and boxing where you put things on your hands to make it hurt the other guy more, as opposed to what we do now, right? Uh, but you know that's what he did when he was younger. And if you read, for instance, his laws or something like that, he talks about the importance of 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 martial arts which for him is boxing wrestling horseback riding archery Amazing. right the the which is like there's an education right there right the importance of these things for uh the the education of what we would think of as the intellectual right because he's not talking about the education of slaves he's talking about the education of you know it's called the liberal arts because it's mm -hmm. the the arts that a free person gets to gets to learn and um you know as opposed to as opposed to the education of a slave right that's literally what liberal art originally meant and for plato and for everyone in the ancient world and everyone in the middle ages like if you were a an intellectual right um basically until monasticism becomes a thing right which gives us but that's i'm not a monk can't be a yeah. monk out of the running you know um uh if you were going to be an intellectual it meant that you had training uh, in whatever martial discipline, you know, your people, you know, practice at the time in how to ride a horse and how to shoot whatever weapon your people were shooting at the time. Like all that stuff is just part of uh, what we would now call a classical education. And this is, mm -hmm. it's actually a huge um, uh, ir source of irritation for me because I'm pretty closely involved in certain classical education circles. Yes. And I would just basically say that you're, unless your school has a wrestling program, it's not classical. Amen. So, yeah, that's that's kind of my would, answer. My God, it's so funny to me the the amount of crossover between our interests is actually yeah, really yeah. ridiculous and crazy. Yeah. I I was teaching at a black Catholic school uh, this past school year, but mm. then I've been in and out of substitute teaching as well. But I have friends who are involved and close friends who are involved in a classical education as well um I'm, bit, I'm more in the kind of montessori camp but there are a lot of things about classical education yeah. that i like and i think inherently whether it's montessori or it's classical education and especially when we bring in the orthodox christianity i would love to see like a judo jujitsu yeah. um some type of program in involved in that too i know uh, the the japanese famously like require judo i think at least in middle school and high school i don't know about yeah the elementary level I, I will bring this uh scriptural quote since we're both fans of scripture from uh, first timothy 4 8 very famous for bodily exercise profits a little but godliness is profitable for all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come during the falling asleep uh, with the lord of kobe bryant who was a practicing uh, Roman Catholic, the archpriest, Father Josiah Trenum, who's very much an LA kid like me, yeah, yeah, eulo yeah. eulogized him and was talking. I like how you relate even other sports like basketball yeah. are all kind of simulated combat, especially football, right? American yeah. football. But he was eulogizing him and talking about how the kind of Mamba mindset that is like obviously uh, gladiatorial in some sense helped motivate him as an Orthodox uh, priest and a, you know, a, a quite yeah. well-known one to, to be better in his pursuits of, of spiritual matters. Yeah. I think there's another uh, great segue question for you. When we're talking about video games, so for example, full disclosure, in my RPG days, like my favorite character was always the necromancer. Um, and then to your other interest, which you know far, far better than me, I've seen all of the kind of modern television and film productions, but the only book I've read is that lovely one behind you there, The Hobbit. Uh, everything oh, yeah. that you've done with The Lord of the Rings and all yeah. of the J.R.R. Tolkien's works, there's this question when you said gladiatorial of almost, are we in the seat of the pagans, you know, mocking and Ignatius yeah. of Antioch and other Christians who right. are there, or when we're doing this video game stuff with this fantasy stuff, I know you've addressed this question elsewhere. So tying all these together, what do you make of the accusations of like Lord of the Rings and these video games and perhaps even this uh, martial arts? There's a certain 
paganness to it? What does it have to do with Christianity that you yeah. are also advocating? Um, I think that the uh, if we were in a situation where um, paganism was the worst thing we had to worry about, I think we'd be in really good shape, honestly. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Christianity has a great track record uh, with paganism. Um, we're good at converting pagans. Um, actually, it's interesting because this is a little side note to what you asked, but um, at our parish, so I attend St. Seraphim Orthodox Cathedral in Dallas, um, Texas, um, at, at our parish, we've had, you know, significant numbers of young people actually coming from neo-pagan and wow. uh, uh, neo-pagan and heathen-ish uh, backgrounds. There's the, actually like a lot of little subcategories, but basically, I mean, this is, these are people sacrificing goats in their backyard sometimes, or members of like occult sects or Gnostic sects and things like this. Uh, coming to, Chris, you know, showing up at, at, at St. Seraphim, never having actually stepped foot in, an, in a Christian church before in their life. And so this cathedral, and we have a beautiful cathedral, it's covered in iconography and, you know, the music and every, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's majestic, right? Yes. And this is their first exposure. And they're like, oh, so I guess this is what Christianity is. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> don't go anywhere else. You only be disappointed now. Uh, but, but, Glory you know, but, but showing up and saying, hey, um, I've tried everything else and it's not working and I'd like to be a Christian now, right? So like paganism, actually, if that was the worst thing we had to deal with, um, I'd be I'd be really, really happy. Um, the problem is that the thing that we really have to deal with in this country specifically, and, you know, to, to the other question, like there, there are, uh, you know, countless Christian nations throughout the world and throughout, you know, the last 2000 years and all of them still had martial arts. Like you think people don't wrestle in Georgia, you know, like <laughs> the most, the, 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 like the, you know, the longest or the second longest Christian country in the world, right? Yeah, either Georgia or Armenia. You think, you think kids don't grow up wrestling in Georgia, Georgia, you know, anyway. Uh, but you know, so that, that said, um, the problem that we have to deal with in this country, which is, you know, in some senses, uh, if, it, if it's ever been Christian, it was like more puritanical than anything. And now we're sort of post-Christian is, um, the, so there's, there's, let's say like a series of two mistakes that you can sort of use to, to characterize modern Christianity. The first is that we have accepted the kind of Manichaean idea that everything that we do with uh, everything good is spiritual mm -hmm. and everything bad is physical, right? And we've implicitly accepted that whether or not we realize it and actually even non-believers accept this, right? This whole, you know, um, even like the, 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 the transgender movement right now is, is in essence, basically an attempt to escape from the body, right? Yes. Uh, so it's saying, I feel this way inside and it's one way, but my body is this way. So it must be my body that's wrong and my feelings that are right, because this is the second part of that mistake. So first we separated the physical and the spiritual, and we said the physical is bad, the spiritual is good. But then we started confusing the spiritual with what is with the thoughts in my head, right? Which actually the thoughts in my head are not really my spiritual life, right? Um, you know, thinking itself is a physical act, right? You know, you've got neurons and chemicals and things like that the things that are on the level of the spirit, you know, you could say the mind's higher than the body, but there's, there's also like a, a further dimension to that, you know, like when the Greek fathers talk about the mind, really talking about the noose, right? Uh, they don't just mean, here's the thoughts that I'm, you know, Richard's thinking in his head or, or whatever, right? They're talking about something that's actually deeper. It goes beyond that. And this is why, for instance, we can commune a, a baby. I assume you guys commune babies. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just I just assumed uh, because and special all, all, needs children for that matter. Yes, and special needs children, right? So, like, if spiritual stuff is just thinky stuff, then people who can't think for whatever reason actually don't get to partake in the spiritual life, which is, uh, which is honestly horrifying. Um, and there are there are Christians who believe that, mm -hmm. uh, um, which which I find deeply horrifying. Um, so so these these are the kind of two like this this is the set of mistakes that we've made and so now even the post christian secular world that we live in in america tacitly ac ac accepts these things so this is why if you understand this this is why it'll help you understand why for instance protestants will say that baptizing somebody for the remission of their sins which the bible says to do by the way um uh they'll say that's works based salvation or something like that why is it a work? Actually, baptism is not a work, right? It's not a good thing that I do to be baptized. It's something 
Christ through his church does for me, mm -hmm. right? So it's his work, it's not my work. But the reason that a Protestant will look at that and see that as a work is because it's something physical that's being done to your body. So this is where I would tie into both the martial arts and the fantasy literature. Um, mm -hmm. This is where this all connects for me. Um, by putting physical activity and and in and, and you know like violent struggle in its proper place, not making an idol of it, right? Um, I don't I don't miss church to go to you know a jujitsu tournament, right? I'm not <laughs> judging people who do, but like yeah. you know, but like these things have a proper place, right? By by putting physical exercise and physical struggle in their proper place, we actually reclaim the goodness of our bodies, right? Um, your body actually should be a temple, right? Um, not not a you know mega church, I guess. But anyway, um, um, <laughs> but uh, your your body should be a temple, so you can reclaim the goodness of your body, right? And then what you'll what you will inevitably understand, and this is why the meme is kind of true. Jiu Jitsu saved my life. Well, did Jiu Jitsu really save your life? No, but what did save your life? Getting off your couch mm -hmm. and going and participating in a difficult embodied struggle with other people and forming relationships based on that, right? That's what saved your life. Now, when it comes to the fantasy stuff, I think that one of the great, and I've got a book I'm working on right now that's gonna be coming out later this year, hopefully, on this whole subject, right? Um, but um, I think that fantasy literature and, and to you know some extent downstream from literature, the other things that come out of literature like films and video yes. games and tabletop gaming and things like that, um, uh, that they have the potential to awaken in us what I call the sacramental imagination. So mm -hmm. what I mean by this is that uh, you can you can um, think of Christian fantasy writing. So Tolkien and Lewis and people like this, you can think of Christian fantasy writing as the the outpouring of an imagination that believes that the physical world can become a mediator of grace. And that through simple things like water, oil, bread, and wine, we can actually come to know God and experience him. Now, when you read a work of fantasy fiction like The Lord of the Rings, this is implicitly shot throughout all of the work. And so if you are a Baptist kid like I was growing up, um, in, deeply hungry for this, but not able to articulate it and with no idea where to look, right? Uh, and then you come across something like Narnia or The Lord of the Rings or, uh, you know, some other compelling work of fantasy fiction. Um, actually, one of my favorite things that really helped convince me um, in a in a like a deep way of the of the, you know, of the the presence of Christ in the in the chalice was um, Bram Stoker's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Wow. Um, the novel is is an amazingly Christian novel. Like, forget any film adaptations you think you've seen. If you haven't read it, just go and read it, and you'll understand what I mean. But like that helped me understand why it's actually significant that this is the body of our Savior, right? And so this is like so that kind of literature has the capacity to awaken your imagination to think in sacramental terms, and when it becomes possible for you to think of this the world in this way, then you are not far from the church then you you can actually sort of start reclaiming the goodness not just of your body but of the whole created world and actually seeing creation as an icon right as a gift from god so that we can know him better um and if you don't have that then you're worse than a pagan right because even the pagans would have said you know there's a god in this river there's a god in this tree well they're not quite right obviously but also in seeing a river as more than a river and in seeing a tree as more than a tree and being able to see both of these things as in some way are presenting the divine to us. Like, you know, even if they're worshiping the wrong gods or something like that, the fundamental, you know, Christianity and paganism aren't two different games. They're two different teams, right? So like they could still see there's something more going on than just what's on the level of the material accidents. And unfortunately, most Christians today uh, in this country have lost that ability. And fantasy is the probably our only shot at reawakening this so that then, you know, once we see it, we can start part to, to participate in the life of the church. But if you just believe that water is water, then when, uh, you know, Theophany, you go for the, like the blessing of the waters or whatever, like it's, 
what are you doing? What's all this about? This is just <laughs> a quaint cultural thing. Like nothing of any cosmic significance can really be happening because water is just water. But if you can, you know, through reading some good fantasy literature, you can come to see water as like, this is the primal, you know, substance of creation. This is the primal substance of chaos. There's a dragon in this water. There's, you know, like all that's, you start to see that stuff. Then when you go to the blessing of the water and you hear those beautiful prayers, mm -hmm. Things are going to click for you, I think. So, a absolutely, absolutely, and um, I think one of the concepts that you guys did a really great job for me of just like having me dwell on this. Like my my favorite words I would balance between before kind of coming across your work was serendipity and grace, and you reintroduced yeah. me to the idea of you catastrophe. Oh yeah. Is there anything you can say about you catastrophe? Um, so you catastrophe for people who don't know, this is a word which Tolkien coined. So a catastrophe is like a sudden calamity, right? So Tolkien coined this, and this is in his, his essay on fairy stories, um, which is the sort of joke, actually, if you go to a Tolkien conference is every other paper is going to be on you catastrophe because it's really <laughs> like, it's Tolkien's big idea. Right. And so for him, what it is, is the, um, you know, you said serendipity and grace, and that's exactly it. It's a it's a sudden inbreaking of grace, right? It's the turn that brings about the happy ending, right? So like things are going real, 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 real bad, and then there's this glimmer of hope. There's this light that comes in, and something turns in the story, um, and usually in a way that you don't see coming. So Tolkien, what Tolkien said was, um, and Tolkien's whole essay on fairy stories is basically about really it's about why it's okay to read fairy stories as a christian right uh, uh fairy stories are, are just what he means by like uh that's just what he calls fantasy right at, at the time there wasn't like a genre fantasy that you know people call that but um but that's what uh, so what he says is that the incarnation is the eucatastrophe of, of history uh -huh. so history is like going in a bad direction from Adam all the way up to the Theotokos, right? Um, and actually even even like in her life, there's this um, uh, like this sort of like winnowing or funneling down of like all the faithful. So it's, at first it's all of humanity and then it's just the descendants of Seth and then it's just the descendants of Noah and then it's just the descendants of, descendants of Shem and then it's just the descendants of, and it just keeps going down and down and down. You know, uh, Abraham, David, you know, all the way down just to, you know, one of the, you know, narrowing all the way down until basically by the time of the mother of God, there's just one faithful family in Israel. Really, really just like one faithful family, her and her parents and Zechariah and Elizabeth, and maybe like a few more people here and there. But, but basically it's just like one faithful family left in Israel, you know, but then out of her, there's this explosion, right? This explosion that brings all of the Gentiles in, right? Which is why I get to be a Christian, right? right. You know, and so that's um, uh, so that's that you catastrophe, that that sudden inbreaking of grace. You know, when Saint Paul says, uh, you know, if if the if the rulers of this world had uh, uh, had recognized Christ, that they would not have crucified the Lord of Glory. I'm butchering the quote a little bit, but. Uh, when he says the rulers of this world, he doesn't mean, you know, Caesar. He means that he means the demons, right? That have enslaved mankind. It was what he's saying is like even to the heavenly powers, you know, good and evil. And this is shot all throughout our our services as Orthodox Christians, right? That the the, the angelic council was amazed seeing the number, like like the angels and the demons both are just constantly sort of flabbergasted. What is going on? <laughs> like the incarnation and everything that came from it, the passion, the resurrection, the ascension, all this stuff was a surprise to the entire cosmos. Nobody saw it coming. Um, and we should always remember, like I always try to be like a little easy on the disciples when I think about this, because, you know, um, I, I definitely heard sermons growing up where it's like, oh, these stupid disciples, they don't understand what Jesus, well, nobody understood, nobody understood, right? Even the angels didn't really understand what was happening until it happened. Um, so yeah, this is the great eucatastrophe of, of history. And then at the end of it all, he says, um, the greater does not destroy the less, right? Uh, this, the gospel has not destroyed legends, it has hallowed them. Right. And and he says, Jesus Christ is now the Lord of men, 
and elves, right? And so actually for Tolkien, it's the very existence of the gospel which makes it possible and also uh, permissible to write these kinds of stories and to tell these kinds of stories and, and to enjoy them, so. Amen. Yeah, that's it's it's so beautiful the way you phrased it. And you know what? His literature is is so fast and intimidating. I guess as an expert on the subject, what I'd like to ask you is, would you advise someone who hasn't touched any of them to begin with fairy stories or The Hobbit or The Fellowship? Oh, bull. okay. If you're going to read Tolkien, um, this is hard because without so so let me put it this way. If you really like weird stuff and the Old Testament, then you should begin with the Silmarillion. Oh, because okay. it's the most Old Testamenty book. And if you're the kind of person who just like wants, I want the lore and I want the legends and the myths and the weird stuff, then start with start with the Silmarillion because it's the most mythic of the books. And then you can go from that to Lord of the Rings and then The Hobbit. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, the idea of reading something like the Old Testament for fun sounds appalling to you, <laughs> then you should start with The Hobbit because The Hobbit basically starts as a children's tale and ends as an Icelandic saga, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's basically like, it's a nice warm up. You start out with this kind of like fun, happy, go lucky children's tale. And then basically the whole register of the book changes about a little past the halfway point. And then from that point on, you're basically in an Icelandic saga. And then you can go read uh, the Lord of the Rings and then tackle the Silmarillion someday if you feel like it. Um, so that that would be my recommendation is start in one of those places. Uh, of course, most people like when they start with this, this stuff, it's accidental, like they saw a movie or they read it, saw a cartoon growing up or, or whatever. And that was their first exposure. And then later they just read whatever book was lying around. But if you if you have no exposure at all and you wanted to start somewhere, then I would just say, like, it just depends on what kind of person are you. If you're the if you're the, you're the kind of person who is like, you know, reading, you know, the historical books of the Old Testament and stuff like that, and you're like, man, I just I wish I had more of this, but like with elves and and stuff, then the Silmarillion is is the book for you. Thank you for those recommendations. Yeah. And I consider myself an amateur philologer. I'll have to come back and ask you if you have any opinions, uh, if we can, so we can get very nerdy about the word philologer versus philologist. But oh, okay. I, I am uh, very biased, and I have a very minority opinion that I would like you to disprove if it's possible. But okay. I see the human kingdoms of Rohan and Gondor, and I know my Ethiopian history a little bit better oh. than the average person. And we have these Amhara kingdoms called Roha and Gondor. No Are kidding. there any connections anywhere that you've ever heard of? Do you think this idea is plausible or am I out of my mind? So that's pretty rad. Um, I, I knew about Gondor, but I didn't know about the other one. Um, Rojas, it's just without Rojas. the end. Just okay. without the yeah. end. Um, so as far as I know, they're not connected. Um, I, I've never come across anything that indicated Tolkien was very aware of like Ethiopian culture or history beyond what was happening in the Second World War. Um, uh, I do he know he was born in South Africa. Is that he was right? Born in or... South Africa. That's true. Uh, and he did have a a, a, a usually underappreciated uh, interest in Semitic languages. I was um, going to say, is it Elven or one of the languages looks a lot like uh, Proto Sinaitic or Proto Hebrew? So um, the one that is the closest to the Semitic language family is Numenorian, uh, mm -hmm. which is like the language of language of men. Um, yeah. And from that, the Manish languages that he develops. And most of that stuff is still unpublished. I have seen like photocopies and stuff like that. Um, and some of it's in kind of obscure journals, but uh, his Manish languages are are basically, yeah, like very proto, uh, proto Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, and those and, Numenorians are the, they're the, the race of men who are very close to the elves. Is yes, that that's right? right. Yeah. yeah. But the Elvish languages are more, um, uh, they're more, well, uh, they're basically their language family, but the two main ones, Quenya, is more. Uh, it has a phonology, phon a phonological system that's based mainly on Finnish, which is actually not a Proto-Indo-European language. And then mm -hmm. um, Sindarin has a phonology that's based very, very heavily on Welsh. Um, so, 
Yeah, it's funny. Uh, people uh, who kind of just have a very cursory knowledge think like Finland is the same as the Scandinavian countries. No, they no, have no, no, they have no idea. And I was actually in conversation with the uh, Bengali geneticist Razib Khan, who was recently kind of explaining. I watched this. a little bit of this conversation. Yeah. Okay, he was explaining in another podcast, not on mine, that the Finnish have some sort of uh, Asiatic ancestry yeah, actually right, and yeah. it's inexplicable because they didn't have like the cavalry technology and so nobody knows what it is so he kind of made the off like joking remark that there were uh you know Asians that descended on skis into Finland but nobody knows exactly yeah. what or how that happened but but somehow yeah it's it's a so, it's a little different back in August I was flying to Lithuania and we went through Helsinki and uh Finland is a gorgeous at least a little bit that I saw of it from the airport but also like you can you can spot a Finnish person across like it's wow. very clear it's very clear um I guess that was one of the weird things about Europe actually um is that uh here in the US we're, we're very homogenized mm -hmm. um uh my family is uh from Germany but before they were in Germany they lived probably in Norway um anyway so when when people uh when people would see me they'd say oh so where are you from and i i'd say well i'm from texas and it's, no, 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 where are your people from right because nobody's from texas except for like yeah. you know obviously the native americans but even like ultimately they're from like over the bering strait you know but anyway yeah. so like 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 when, no, no, where are you from so oh well i'm i'm from my people are from germany and they'd look at me and they'd say you don't look german and and they, they would do this so the third time i said okay what do i look like to you because it was like very important for people to like be able to like figure out which box i went in you know yeah and so finally i was like well what do i look like and they're like well you look scandinavian um wow. and and look at that guy over there he's scandinavian you guys could be brothers and i look at over at that guy and it's like yeah okay that could be my brother um so it's, it, but it was interesting because you, you could be walking down the street and you could tell if somebody was a Balt, like, like Lithuanian or, you know, or, or, or somebody's Russian or somebody's Ukrainian or somebody's Finnish. And you could just tell walking down the street where people were from, because like the bone it is really the bone structure is so like the differences were, were so pronounced. And, um, you anyway, it's just, it was, it was really interesting. Um, uh, people were like, uh, it was a little refreshing to be totally honest because people were like, you know, enjoy discussing differences, but it wasn't yeah. like this, this like toxic thing, yeah. you know, you know, it was and, a non-offensive uh, right. physiognomy. And it's funny because out groups usually will say like, oh, you people all look alike. But when you get to the the kind right. of in group level, they they know these distinctions. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Whiteness in America uh, especially as it's most often written about these days is a kind of non-identity or blankness. But if you're going to the white or Northern that's, European homeland, people are distinguishing it. That's a really good way to put that. I I've been, I've been struggling to put that into words, but that's a really good way to, way to put it is, is like, it wasn't this negative, Oh, well, it's just your non-identity. You're just vanilla or whatever. But I was like, Oh, you know? And so then like, once they were like, once they were like, oh, so your your people are from Scandinavia. Well, that explains some things about you. You know, kind of a, my ancestors haven't lived in Scandinavia in like 400 years, but it doesn't matter. Like, they're just like, oh, well, this this is why you are the, not in a bad way. Like, it wasn't mean spirited or anything. It was just kind of like, you know, and 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 uh, it's just like, oh, well, you'll probably be on time to this thing that I invited you to or, or whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, which is true, which is true. Like, I have, yeah. a, I have like an in inborn nature uh uh you know when when uh when like our our like mediterranean parishioners show up like right yeah. before the gospel reading or whatever i'm like <laughs> you know that's so funny. I, i've been here for three hours you know yeah. but um yeah the ethiopians yeah. uh and black folks in general in the united states are known for if you have ever heard of it cpt or color people time some people say black people time but it's funny that i find myself to have culturally adapted to oh, punctuality yeah. and i have another like one of my best friends he's ethiopian as well and he's very 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 punctual and at one time uh we met up for coffee i was early he showed up early too and i was shocked at how him and i were so simple i was like how are you like this he's like if you're on time you're late and i was like wow that's, that's my dad told me that <laughs> growing up if you're on time so, if you're early you're on time if you're on time you're late and if you're yeah. late you may as well be dead 
so know, I've, yeah. I've actually kind of assimilated to yeah. whatever what may be i guess scandinavian uh culture but it's funny if you've i don't know if you follow like me some of the political stuff it's funny that yeah, there yeah, are yeah. these funny like powerpoints that these crazy speakers get paid tens of thousands of dollars for about white fragility and things like that and one of the things uh, that made the rounds on twitter one time was that they said that punctuality was a mark of white supremacy and <laughs> yeah <laughs> i couldn't I, I couldn't laugh harder I've sat in like corporate presentations where the people said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, now, like the flip side to that is like, if somebody was late, I wouldn't make a big deal about it. Yes. You know, that's also just Correct. good manners, you know, but, uh, but, but I, I personally, I just get very stressed if I'm late to things. Um, yeah. I don't tend to get stressed if other people are late, you know, unless it's like inconvenient, really inconveniencing lots of people. Yeah. But, you know, if I, if I'm late to something, I just, I get really, really anxious about it. Um, you know, to the point that my wife was very German. Yeah. um uh like 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 you know recognizably german um in fact when i would uh, when i was in europe so i have five kids um, amazing and when i was in europe i would show people pictures of my family and uh no one in europe has has five children so people would be like what how how is that possible how could anyone do this you know like like they were excited about it because they thought it was cool but like just never seen it and um uh, even like re like religious families, like it was just it's totally unheard of now in the EU to have more than two or three kids at the most, and th even that that's a lot, you know. Um, and uh, and so we, you know, I show them a picture of my family, and they'd be like, "Oh, your wife is very German," you know, like like, and yeah, she's got the the facial shape, and you know, anyway, yeah, it's just it's just a, a it's an inter like her family, they were like Schaubs and Kirchgesners and Rhodes and. Anyway, just like a bunch of like super German names. I mean, I think one of her ancestors actually died when he was run over by a beer wagon. And if that's wow. not the most German thing there is, I don't, I don't know what is. But, um, <laughs> but even she is like, you need to like calm down with the punctuality thing. Like we're fine, yeah. we're fine. It's gonna be okay, you know. But for me, I'm like, I want to have 15 minutes of lead time. Mm -hmm. You know, get, I, you know I, I'm with you. If I'm in a I, new place, if I'm in a new place, I want to be there half an hour early just to like, yeah. And that's almost the samurai in me. Like, uh, I think, I don't know if it was Miyoro Musashi or one of these uh, legendary samurai would always arrive early somewhere to kind of get a scope of the land. Yeah, you got to you gotta case, the, <laughs> case the joint, you know? <laughs> so yeah, yeah that, might, that might be our martial sciences maybe, uh, maybe training so, yeah. there. Um, just a, a kind of lightning question. Do you ever have any thoughts on philologer versus philologist as a word? And could you tell the people what philology is? Yeah, so philology literally means the love of words, but somebody who is a philologist they're actually kind of, it's kind of a broad uh, term that is, it means slightly different things in slightly different contexts. So, uh, but basically a philologist is somebody who studies uh, like uh, uh, diachronic linguistics, right? You know, like you could say like the study of language and literature through time. So the way that one language changes into another, changes into another, changes into another. And then also like the literature, because like the literature is where you find all those really old words. Yes. Um, so I'm for the, by training, I'm a Germanic philologist. So that means that I'm mainly concerned with the Germanic family of languages. So things descending from what at the time of Christ uh, is what we now call proto-Germanic, although of course they would not have called it that. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't even call themselves German. They still don't. Yeah. But uh, uh, but yeah. So like you Proto-Germanic, and then um, uh, and then that evolves into uh, eventually into like a whole bunch of related languages like modern day German and English and Icelandic and the Scandinavian languages and so on. Uh, so like studying those languages and the ways that they're related. And then also I'm a per person who's more sort of a, more of an old school philologist in the sense that I'm I'm especially interested in. Uh, also the growth and progression of myths through these cultures. So you could say there are like, for instance, um, uh, the the most ancient Indo-European myth yes. is, the, is the idea of like slaying the dragon, hero slays serpent, right? The, you know, the chaos comp, the war with chaos, right? So that's, that's like the most ancient Indo-European myth, but then it kind of grows and changes in all these different ways in Germanic cultures and then in Indo-European languages as a whole. Um, as far as the distinction between philologer and philologist, I've actually, this is the first, my first time hearing somebody say philologer. Oh, so please okay. explain. I think it's the archaic. So it's similar to like, oh, interesting. This dream to whilst versus while, amongst versus among, betwixt versus uh, between. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll have to look into that. Um, I'll, 
let, give me uh, give me some time to uh, crack some books open, and then I'll next time we, no we have a conversation, I'll uh, I'll try to weigh in. Yeah, no worries. And and sometimes I kind of use them in comp uh, in uh, combination because there is this um, American. I don't know where it comes from culturally, but uh, kind of some writers I see write, and I, I do think about writing because I'm a writer as well, but a lot more short form than you. Is this idea that redundancy is bad but i'm very much in the new antiochian school which is a, a shout out to the old antiochian school of father paul nadim tarazi and so i'm very much into what scripture and especially the psalms presents as the synonymic parallelism uh, parallelism saying the same thing but in different ways like right, course, famous yeah. one is uh save uh, thy people and bless thy inheritance right, right? yeah yeah many many such cases like this i want to ask a kind of chicken egg question were you inspired to enter philology because of tolkien or did you like tolkien because you were already a lover of words uh bro, that is a chicken and egg question so i grew up in a bilingual family um so my mother grew up uh the daughter of protestant missionaries in taiwan wow um, and so she grew up like she moved there when she was like two so she grew and then stayed there until she came home for college and married my dad speaking cantonese or what uh mandarin mandarin wow Ta taiwan is mandarin mandarin okay uh, they also have taiwanese was like the local indigenous language but yes um but yeah so so mandarin so mandarin was kind of my second language growing up and wow. so this is actually how i got interested in linguistics initially as a very young person it's just because uh, english and mandarin are such radically different languages mm -hmm. um and there's no you know there's there's really no like like tense or case uh, in Mandarin, right? But but you have like certain words that that basically do that lifting in the sentence instead. Um, anyway, things like so so just like noticing things like that, trying to figure out why it's different. That's what got me to play around with language. Um, you know, like as far as like trying to make my own, you know, invent my own languages. You know, a, a hobby that's called conlinging, uh, constructed languages, which is still something I do a lot of. Um, obviously, you know, I've got a a a, a book that just kick, you know, a, a, a uh, two role, uh, two books of a tabletop role playing game with a bunch of invented language and myths and stuff in it. But basically, that's how I got interested in that sort of thing. So then, when I found Tolkien, I was like, "Oh, I'm not the only person," you know, because when you're young, yeah. you're, you're like, "Maybe I'm the only one," and you're like a little yeah. embarrassed by it. So then, when I found Tolkien, I was like, "Oh man, here's somebody who did it and like did it at this really high level." And then that's what that's what ultimately uh, motivated me to study philology, Germanic philology, because that was his discipline. So, yes. Yeah. So, so maybe my love of language comes from just the household that I grew up in, but my my pursuit of linguistics and of philology, especially as a discipline, comes from Tolkien. When I was a kid, I was left alone a lot, yeah. and so was my best friend, and we both had this kind of thing that I later read Lewis and Tolkien kind of did with each other where we created, we literally created these fantasy worlds. And in my personal one, it was like a weird uh, Super H who was kind of basically an Ethiopian Superman. But then he was like occupying a world with like the Christian God, but then like the mythologies of all the like TV shows, like there oh, would be Raiden fine. and Thor and all these like different mythologies in one. And I later came uh, when I was older to realize that this is called uh, a paracosm. Yep. And, um, my friend and I were kind of like nervous, embarrassed to talk about it because people looking onto us would think we're like schizophrenic or crazy because we're like literally like full on role playing by ourselves. But then sometimes we would combine our paracosms, which I had heard uh, Tolkien and Lewis did. Did you do anything like that as a kid? And oh, were you kind yeah. of al alone a lot? Uh, I, I mean, so I, I was um, I had a lot of siblings. I have uh, seven siblings. Amazing. So al alone is relative. Yeah. But um, but I mean, basically, yeah, I was homeschooled. And so I, you know, I do my school and I'd be done with school. I mean, basically up until high school, there's really no reason for a kid to have to do school for more than three or four hours a day, I think. But anyway, yeah, Same. so we, yeah, I would do, I would do, uh, I would do uh, school until like 11 or 12. And then what I'm going to yeah spend the rest of the day playing in the backyard or or, or meeting up with a neighbor friend or uh you know building stuff out of legos or you know just whatever and reading obviously lots and lots of reading um and uh so i i did have a neighborhood friend I actually talked about this this morning in a in a live stream that i did on on role-playing games uh with uh, 
with uh, Grail Country um, on on Twitter. Um, but you know, I basically like we made our own worlds and our own games and like rules for playing them and all the stuff. And it's funny because none of us had ever seen an RPG before, and we had no idea uh -huh. what, what we would had not have known what that was. But we just like di like I think it feel feels like a necessary sociological niche. And so, like, even if you don't have one, you'll make something like it. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, there's some work recently that um, th there's a series of tablets that are basically like they seemed like weird, bad retellings of the Iliad or something like that, um, like mm -hmm. Bronze Age tablets. And they've just started to realize that they they were probably something like sort of a choose your own adventure novel. Yes, like amazing. A, way of, I didn't see a that. way of making a game out of the Iliad. And like, because you have to think people do this stuff all the time. Yes. I mean, like back then, the Homeric cycle was like the MCU. And yeah. and like, uh, I mean, there were more, you know, there, there, were, there were seven Homeric epics, you know, that we know of in the ancient world. And we only have two of them. Now, the two that survived are the longest. Most of them are a lot shorter, but, um, you know, we just have them in summary form. But like, you know, we there there were stories like there was a, a sequel to the Odyssey. You know, what mm -hmm. happens to Odysseus? You know, when he gets old and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So obviously, like you think kids didn't grow up playing Achilles and and home and and and, and, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, Hector and and Ajax and like all those guys. Like, um, of course they did. Of course they did. Yeah. Like, like the fact that you know most of the Iliad and the Odyssey are what cooking and wrestling. Like these are the th these are things people are concerned about at all times and in all places. You know. So that's right. yeah. When I was very young and I was into R.L. Stein's Goosebumps series, my favorite of the Goosebumps series were always the choose your own adventure. And there were yeah, times yeah, yeah. where I would read the book choosing my own adventure, but then I would like rewind it and choose a different path. 100%. Just to see where it goes. I did those. I I never I was never allowed to have goosebumps as a kid, but uh <laughs> uh but uh but I, I definitely did lots of those choose your own adventure things and um uh, actually just wrote a choose your own adventure for my for my own paracosm, if you will. Yes, um, and uh, so it it went out to like people backed me on Kickstarter for the 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 game. Then one of the rewards that you get is is the choose your own adventure that I wrote. Um, but it's like it's choose your own adventure own adventure, but it's also a little gamified. So you actually you have your character sheet and some dice, and then you have the choose your own adventure, and you get to certain places, and it's like all right, you're gonna roll for this, and then based on the outcome, you know, flip to such and such a page. You know, uh, it was a lot of fun to write. Um, I I basically to prep for that one i went back and just did like compile the list of here's the 20 greatest choose your own adventure and solo rpgs of all time and just like read through all of them and try to figure out why is this good why do people like it and then wrote my own so um, that, yeah I, that's, that's so great i i want to look forward to your work and definitely when we wrap up i want you to plug everything so everyone can continue yeah. to support those projects and get after them and i need to uh you'll forgive me a sinner before because i haven't experienced them yet but i okay. i certainly i certainly uh will i want to go back to this point because i'm a you know a history buff as well and especially in the united states history uh, growing up in california i had like my fourth grade teacher Mrs. Inouye, shout out to her if she's still alive. When she was a kid, she was interned. She was Japanese American and she was interned. Oh, wow. And it wasn't until I was in my adult life, because I knew a lot about the Japanese, that I had learned that German Americans and uh, Italian Americans had some of the same things done to that. And it was some of my reading of the great American writer, H.L. Mencken, who was very pro-German, that allowed me to kind of uh, see that and understand that yeah. and and then i also lived for a time in uh, the legendary north dakota that's how they refer to themselves where there are a lot of germans and scandinavians yep. who, who are like 90 percent of the population there and yep. I, I spent uh, quite a time getting to to be with them and and know them so i got to know a little bit about this more but you see how the kind of uh german language is suppressed a little bit there's also uh you know obviously the word aryan but even words like Indo-European, I see in academe, and even more recently, the word Anglo-Saxon. And oh, this yeah. question about whether the Anglo-Saxons are native to the UK, to the Isles, uh, is this question that I see. I want to ask you yeah. uh, if you could talk about, like, beginning with Germanic, like, and, and, and this hammer in on this point of they might not have identified this way, particularly because of their decentralized tribalness. Right. And I think the show on Barbarians on Netflix gets to a little bit of this. But if you could talk about, like, how far ranging and connecting is the idea of Germanic and then to Indo-European. Indo yeah. 
Um, so when I said earlier, they don't call themselves Germans, uh, their name for the, the name of the German people for themselves is Deutsche, right? Deutsche just means the folk, the people, right? Um, which is actually <laughs> probably what a lot of people call themselves, but, um, but yeah, so, so like, uh, uh Deutsch, Germany is Deutschland, right? The, the land of the people, the folk land, right? Um, uh, Germ modern Germany as it is, is a, um, and I talked about this a lot um, uh, in my symbolism of, of nationalism video that I did with Jonathan Bejo. It's the most recent installment in the Universal History series. Uh, so for people who, who want to check that out, um, uh, the philology, and actually the reason philology is, is uh, practiced far less as a, as a discipline now, is because it was so closely tied with the rise of Germanic nationalism. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, the, the the godfather of philology is Jakob Grimm, um, who was, uh, you know, famously of Grimm's fairy tales. Except that that was like a side project, and his his main <laughs> thing was a really big dictionary, um, and then a big big book on Teutonic mythology or, or you know uh, uh, German mythology, which in which he gets you know a lot of things wrong because he's just kind of guessing at certain things. But <clears throat> anyway, the point is. Um, when, uh, when the, the very first, like, uh, you know, the German equivalent of like Congress, um, when they, uh, when they meet for the very first time, uh, Jakob Grimm has a chair set aside for him, um, at the, at the, um, it's not Congress. I can't remember what they called it now, but anyway, uh, at the assembly. Um, and it is basically like basically saying we're trying to create a new nation, Germany. And philology is an important part of that because th there was this idea. And to be totally fair, not a, an, not an idea that was unique or particular to Germany. Uh, we remember the Germans doing it because it got out of hand later. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but this idea of, of nationalism is this idea that we're, because we're all, uh, all, it's this idea of all the people who are united by a particular language and then language is never separate from never separable from culture so um and even even like the woke left understands this which is why they're always trying to mess with the language right because it's a way of manipulating the culture but um but everybody everybody does this so like this this idea that this idea that um the the idea that the German, you know, that if we get like, like there's a, a family of Germanic languages, so we can get everybody, you know, uh, who is, you know, who, who speaks this sort of group of languages and has kind of this inherited culture, uh, which includes like mythology and folklore and all this stuff, get all those people together and let's make a united front against them. Well, who's them? Well, it's initially, it's basically Francophone. Uh, culture, which at that point dominated Western Europe, um, and really the world at that particular point in history. Even the Russian elite spoke French. Yeah, right. Yeah, like everybody, like you know, everybody speaks French, right? There's a so, reason that the people who founded Saint Vladimir's went to France. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. So you have, um, you have this, this. So like the, initially, the them was we are asserting a national identity in the face of. We've got Russia over here. We've got France over here. We've got, you know, like, obviously then them eventually becomes like people who are not of Indo, what at, at the time they called Indo-Aryan descent, mm -hmm. um, which, which, which is basically, so originally the word Aryan is related to like the name of the modern country of Iran, right? Kind of the same word. So Indo-Aryan would be a group of people who came from somewhere in the Eurasian steppe about 6,000 six to 10,000 years ago um, by the best guess of modern scholarship. And they were um, people who, who, you know, were uh, nomadic, probably, probably, you know, very like steppe culture um, and basically rode into Europe and rode into the Indian subcontinent and, uh, f and, and basically founded civilizations, which although, you know, modern people think, oh, Anglo-Saxon England, and like the Sassanid Persia, Persia don't have a lot in common, but actually yeah. they do. Actually, they're both mm -hmm. Indo-European cultures, and they actually have very similar like uh, societal structures and you know social mores and things like this. So this is all Indo-European civilization. Nowadays we say Indo-European mm -hmm. because uh, the Aryan thing makes some people 
nervous for, for, good, for a good reason. Like I, I'm yeah. not, but, but so, so that's, um, that's what we mean by Indo-European now. Uh, so because Germanic philology was very closely involved with the rise of German nationalism, mm -hmm. which obviously ended in a very ugly way. Right. Um, there's, there's, there was like this massive overcorrection in the other direction. So even like somebody like, like Tolkien, who was a Germanic philologist, but had, you know, low, nothing but loathing for the Nazi party. Right? Yeah. You know, famously so. Right. Uh, but even like his discipline and, and like the chair, his chair at the university and things like that was all affected by this. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, of course they didn't call it, they didn't call it Germanic philology at the time at, at Oxford. They just called it the English department. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's English. Right. Um, now, you know, as far as like the, the, what happened to the U S between the first and second world war and, and just kind of in around that is that a lot of, and I think that German, Im, German immigrants are still the largest demographic, you know, you know, by, by the numbers in the U S wow. Um, more, more than, uh, the Anglos. Or you're yeah. including you're including Anglo within it. Like, no, 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 no. Like like people from people from what is now modern day Germany, I think are still wow. the largest. It's either the largest or the second largest demographic. The Scotch Irish are are maybe the largest, but wow. Uh, but obviously people have intermarried so much, it's of you know, but but I'm just saying like descendants by number, let's say. Yeah. Um, and a lot of things about American culture are still deeply German. Like all almost all the foods, except for like pizza, that we we think of as being like American foods, even if they're junk foods. The hamburger. the hamburger right the the even the hot dog which is really a frankfurter right mm -hmm. right these like these are german foods american beer is really just german beer and so mm -hmm. on um and so you have you had people from these germanic countries that settled all throughout the especially the midwest and uh so like you could say the first wave of immigration that came from that came from england like that they settled an area and they called it new england right yes. um so, but then the next wave of immigration was the Germans. And basically whatever the new wave of immigration is, we hate those guys. So <laughs> when, it, when it was the Germans coming, uh, it was, you know, they were, they were like heavily discriminated against. Um, there's a really good case to be made. I spent a lot of time uh, in my undergrad um, doing a, a research project on the prohibition, which is a period of American history I just find yes. really fascinating. And there's a very strong case to be made that the prohibition was basically fueled by anti-immigrant sentiment against German and Irish Catholics. Wow. Um, uh, Germans especially, so Germans don't drink uh, hard liquor as a rule. Now, obviously there's things like schnapps and, and so on. I'm not saying that nobody does it, but it's not a part of like German culture the way that beer is. So we're all, all, obviously all familiar with like the sort of the, the, the parody that Oktoberfest has become uh, in this country, but uh, there's, there's, but, but like the, 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 the center of the German community is the church and the beer garden, right? Yes. The beer garden, right? And the beer garden is, uh, it's an open air place as the, the garden kind of, you know, a, a, a gart is something with a wall around it, right? So it's like kind of an open air place and they make the beer there, but then there are tables and there's grass. And what do you do? You go and you have a couple of beers and you go, it's a whole family thing. You go to church, you go to mass, and then you come to the beer garden afterwards. Yes. And, the kids run around and play. And we have these breweries like this. One of my favorite places to go with the family. Uh, I don't do this so much because the friends that we uh, used to go with the most kind of moved away. But there's this awesome kind of beer garden um, brewery just like five minutes from our parish. And you go there and they have it's this exact thing. It's open air. There's grass. There's like a little they have like bikes and stuff for the kids and like a little track where they can drive them and toys and a playground. So you can come and you can have a couple of beers and your kids play and it's very wholesome nobody gets like stupid drunks there are kids here man and 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 so everybody's like well behaved and but what are you you're having some beers you're talking you're cooling off in the heat like all this it's just really great and that was the basis of like german american culture especially like in the midwest uh which is where my people settled in ohio originally um but also there were a lot of germans that came down to texas and mexico called the it's a group of people now uh, that call themselves the Deutsche Mexikaner. Uh, that is, that is the, the, the German Mexicans, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is where, uh, to tie all of this back to the UFC, um, uh, Modelo, uh, yes. rude for those with a fighting spirit, um, 
uh, Modelo is a, is a German beer, right? Um, I did not know that. Yeah. Oh my God. All American, like uh, all Mexican cerveza is German beer. So Modelo, wow. like any, you. any, uh, any, well, specifically any Mexican lager, right? Mm -hmm. Is a German beer. And it's because why? Well, because a bunch of Germans came and settled in Mexico. At one point, German, uh, Mexico even had a German emperor and, and he brought a bunch of brewmasters with him and they set up breweries. And those yeah. breweries are the breweries that now make Modelo and Dos Equis and, and, you know, Corona and all that stuff. So like all that stuff is like, that's all German beer, you know? So, um, uh, and, and actually Mexico today remains the only Latin American country, which drinks more beer than it does wine. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so, so there are a lot of Germans that settled down here as well. And there's a huge german presence in central texas all the place names are german place names in central texas um but very much like other places in the country between the first and second world wars people changed their names you know schmidt to smith and so on mm -hmm. um and a lot of people just stopped speaking german uh which is um unfortunate because actually the the the, the form of german that they were speaking as immigrants is older than what's currently being spoken in modern day germany and so yeah. there are a whole lot of there are a whole lot of just from a philological standpoint it's really interesting if you go find people who still speak this dialect of german and there are some people like the um, amish uh it's a little bit like that um that's kind of a uh, that's another example but uh, uh and uh, like a weirder example for certain reasons but a very very um uh so for instance the word skunk right a skunk mm -hmm. skunk is not a german word it's a um anything with a k like that like an sk sound probably comes from uh, ultimately comes from uh uh danish um but but like skunk is not it's not an anglo-saxon word it's not an it's not a german word um so but if you go to if you go to like this part they this part of texas they don't call skunks skunks they call them stunk cat stink cat which wow. is which is like the old german word for it right so things like that it's pretty neat um uh, but that's a and that part of Texas is really really lovely. I mean, it's it never gets like too hot there. Like Central Texas is is where it's at. Like if I could if I could just move anywhere right now, I would just move to Central Texas because you know it's great, it's beautiful. There's a lot of water and uh, it never gets above like 84 degrees or something. You know, during, throughout the year, um, it's hellishly hot in North Texas this week. Um, um, I'm I'm a native, so I'm enduring. But a lot of our a lot of our Californian refugees are like, what is happening? <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, anyway, so all that to say, you know, they're, they're the, the things that happened in, in and around the Second World War are awful on every conceivable level, right? It's really the, um, and there's a lot of blame to be laid at the feet of the German people, not always the blame that people in, initially think, you know, because like Hitler wasn't grown in a vacuum um uh it's really the fault of like the german enlightenment um uh german rationalism the you know the whole german protestant project project that gives us like the historical critical method for butchering the scriptures and like all these different things like yeah. um there's a and lot he built of... off of the french uh the yeah. francophone himself yes. uh, uh, yes. count was it count gobineau i think so yeah so anyway um but you know that that said it's it's a huge shame that we don't have the ability right now as a country to like hold things in tension and sort of say you know there were some you know you know uh regrettable fruits of german nationalism but maybe that's not a good reason to start censoring the word anglo-saxon and things like mm. yeah. yeah not yeah. toss out the baby with the uh, bath yeah, water right exactly so Here's a maybe an interesting question for you. Would you be interested in like a project? Because um, it's funny, my I have a good friend, Dr. Richard Benton, who's uh, associated with the kind of Ephesus School where I do my Bible study podcast. And he, because of Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel, uh, really loves the diversity of languages and just kind of keeping it that way and everybody studying it. And he sees it as kind of a hedge against empire a hedge yeah. against the kind of the sins of putting our names in the stars or in the heavens yeah, 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 yeah. um but sometimes i i see that but sometimes i kind of like the ability to kind of have a lingua franca would you oh, yeah. want a kind of uh either concocted or agreed upon 
uh, German lingua franca amongst all of these Germanic people, like, like, like or is Ger English like a Germanic Esperanto kind of a thing? Yeah, or um, or is English that even though English is a mutt of, of French and German and, and other things? I mean, I mean, I so I I sort of resent the idea that English is a mutt. Um, uh -huh. Okay, I, I think that English is is a thoroughly Germanic language. It has vocabulary from French, but so does German. Mm -hmm. Like 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 um. If you want a fun kind of a project, you can go look up something called English, A N G L I S L I S H. Um, English is like somebody's trying to do like a conling of basically we, it's English, but we only use Germanic roots. Um, and that is a pretty neat experiment. But like every every language has loanword vocabulary. Um, uh, insular languages, especially, we're not. We're not English isn't like special in this way. I, I I hate this like bad meme level take that you get from like McC Mc, uh, uh, McWhorter and and people like this where where uh -huh. our well, bastard tongue. Yes, yeah, I, I hate that. I hate that. And like, what if there's a Celtic substrate and like all this different stuff? Like, as though English is like this special language that the rules of other languages don't apply to it. And sure, English has things that seem irregular if you're coming from Mandarin or something like this. But um, but it's a it's a it's a perfectly normal language. It's a perfectly normal language, and there's no I mean there's no European language that doesn't have a bunch of French words. This is just history the way that it is. So I'm I'm kind of like so I I, I don't see English really as a mutt. Um, I see it as a Germanic language with a bunch of Latinate vocabulary. You know, also like German, uh, mm -hmm. which also has a bunch of Latinate vocabulary, and and Swiss, which also has a bunch of Latinate vocab. Like, you know, pick your thing. Um, you know, if I mean, if I had to, if I had to, like, if I wanted to, like, go, go, like, this far, I'd be like, let's all start speaking old, you know, like modern Icelandic, which is pretty yeah. close to being old Icelandic and doesn't actually have a lot of Latin vocabulary, um, except for things like ecclesiastical words, mm -hmm. um, which you know, makes sense. Yeah. So, so, but, but I, I don't, um, all the Greek terms in Giz are ecclesiastical. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's I mean, this is just how history happened, right? So mm -hmm. um, but I so I, I, I don't really see the need, I guess. Um, I, I feel like, you know, for good or for ill right now, English is the that's the international language right now. And yeah. um, uh, sometimes it seems a little unfortunate to me because there are beautiful local languages which people just stop learning. Yeah. And as, a, as a, somebody who loves language, like kind of for its own sake, I'm like, no, 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 no. no. No, 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 because I like you have to teach me. You can't, yeah, you can't just decide you're going to stop speaking Gaelic or whatever. Like, you got to, because I want to learn, you know. So, I heard a, a Gaelic psalmody one time, and it was one of the most yeah. beautiful things in the world. Um, I didn't know about this pushback you were saying about McWhorter, but McWhorter is actually one of my favorite uh linguist i've heard him uh, and i read his book uh, talking back talking black it's like a about black english and he's not even like a black I, english i've read scholar. that one it's that was yeah. pretty good that i i don't like dislike him as a person or anything like yeah. that i just like but but like sometimes you can do something that's a little like write a book for instance that's like a little too successful yes and i feel like that's what our bastard tongue was our it's bastard just, tongue does a, that yeah a, a but now his like on his Lexicon Valley podcast, he covered this kind of Phoenician connection potentially. And after hearing a Gaelic psalmody, I was like, maybe I believe it. Like, and again, it's not like it fully replaced or something, but perhaps had some uh, ancient um, connections there. In in studying a little bit of the Indo-European myths, but probably knowing uh, only an ounce of what you know, I've come across this thing also of being a fan of fairy stories and uh, uh, RPG video games. There's this uh, tripartite classes of priests, warriors, and commoners. We used the word Indo earlier, and what I've heard about the Indian subcontinent or yeah. South Asian version is that because of the Vedic texts, they preserved in writing, and I'm always curious about why and how that happened, in a way that the other step in Indo-European places didn't because they were kind of these verbal, you know, barbarians or par pastoralists. So they didn't have the, the, the yeah. writing. Uh, and, and maybe because of that writing, the uh, Indo-European myths as they survived in the Vedic texts of the Indian subcontinent switched the, the hierarchy of the tripartite classes where the Brahmin or the priests are at the highest level. Right. I wonder what you can tell me about these classes and where where do you see yourself? Because I almost see you as a blend, like a warrior monk, like a priest and a warrior. Um, well, so I think that theory is probably right. Um, like as far as it goes, like I think that um, 
it, I mean, it's it's a it's a personal annoyance of me as like an Indo-Europeanist and other I know others who feel this you know same way. It's a personal annoyance of mine that people like treat like Sanskrit like it's the oldest thing um, mm -hmm. when it when it's really it's a cognate with the other oldest things, right? Um, yes. But that being said, I have a particular interest in um, that branch of Indo-European. Like if I like if I it's the it's the outside of the Germanic family. It's the family of languages I've studied the most, specifically um, old um, like Avestan, like old Persian. Um, it's kind of my that's that's low key. That's my favorite language. Um, um, and um, it's definitely the case, I think, that. Uh, um, the, the, there there is something like the old class structure or the old i mean uh even in um uh the middle ages right in the west you had the the division of society into mm -hmm. those who work those who pray those who fight yeah yeah so um yeah uh but, yeah. are you are you a warrior are you a priest are you are you both i don't mean priest like an orthodox yeah. christian priest yeah. but like you're obviously into literature which is very priest like but right. you're also a warrior so do, um, do you do you uh, smash these together? Are you the in the liminal space between these tripartite classes? I, I mean, if I if I had to pick like favorite person, you know, from the Bible, right? It's the 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 king and prophet David, right? Who's like the warrior and the poet. And mm -hmm. um, that I've always definitely felt like there's like some part of my life that's about bringing those two aspects together in some way. Um, and certainly, like there are historically lots of people who fell into this, you know. Uh, you know, basically all the great mythological heroes and lots of awesome samurai and uh, what's his name who drank a bottle of sake and wrote a thousand poems and, you know, like, you know, lots of, there are lots of warrior poets in, you know, like, history and mythology and folklore and things like that. And and I think that's always, you know, um, I, I always wanted to start a, I always wanted to start a group called like the Warrior Poet Society. I think I just always yes. like like we we meet. I will and join. We wrestle and then we read like <laughs> epic poetry and we call it yes. epic, like like just like bring those things together. Um, I do think it's a weird, um, let's say a weird um, consequence of our decadence as a society that we're like oh no 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 poetry is for the pencil neck nerd or like whatever humanities has become now like in academia mm -hmm. which lord of mercy i don't even want to talk about it you know <laughs> but like yeah, like, so like 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 so it's like these people over here and then fighters are just like the 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 neanderthals like mm -hmm. over and there's you can't like you can't actually legitimately love both things um and uh, that's always that's always been something i've kind of like i but i think that like that going to extremes in that way is is the sign of like just cultural decadence like we've we've kind of like lost our uh, uh um i don't want to say like vitality but maybe that's the right word but just like lost our lost our ability as a culture to to actually even have culture and enjoy it as such right um so yeah well well said and and well met you you mentioned the universal history earlier yeah. can you talk about uh how you became friends with John and then Pajot and thanks to you you're the one who actually connected us originally yeah, very yeah. funny at the time we were already Facebook friends and I kind of just let anyone like cut in so we were Facebook friends but I didn't like I know I don't think you and I really interacted no, I don't think so, that, yeah. that was the kind of the first time we, just because I saw you were orthodox I was like yeah orthodox guy that's great yeah. and um and I, I found your stuff and I was like hey Jonathan here's an Ethiopian person talk to him yeah you know, yeah yeah. And, yeah and he happens to be a deacon too so that's cool yeah um, yeah uh, and I would argue. Can I, ask, can I ask you a question about that? Because yeah. like I don't always under. So like there's like, as I understand it, maybe I'm wrong about it, but sort of like levels of deacons. Yes. In the Ethiopian Church, right? So like there are a lot yeah. of like lower orders, and you just you guys just call all of them deacon. So like, yes. what kind of deacon are you? What are you? Do you have a liturgical role? Are you are you married? Are you? I I defy. Um... I defy categorization because I'm a postmodernist. No, uh, <laughs> that's what happens when you're a postmodern yeah. reactionary. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so what what happens is um, historically, allegedly, and liturgically, in fact, we have all of the ranks of deacon that. What I, and you'll excuse me, I refer to them linguistically because I'm an amateur philologist. I refer to your communion as the Greeks, and sure, I think you'll yeah. think it's fair. It's fine. It's fine. Because of the Greek rite, which is the source, whereas yeah, right. ours yeah. kind of started with multiple rites. And so even the Greeks, right, uh, you all, right. 
um, you have all these ranks. By the way, you have the same thing in our communion, uh, which uh, you can say unfairly, but I'll call the indigenous of Antioch and of uh, Alexandria, who uh, the Copts began with Greek, but later went to Coptic. And then Antioch always had this kind of Syriac, which is the right, literary right, right, Aramaic. Right, yeah. And they, and, and the Armenians who uh, stem from Antioch, yeah. uh, although they very quickly got their own Armenian up and running, um, and they're on their own bishops, by the way, which they didn't let us have for quite a while. Uh, but uh, they have the same ranks the way you do. So it starts off with like chanter, and right. then it goes from chanter to anagonistus or reader, from right. reader to subdeacon, deacon right. to deacon, uh, excuse me, subdeacon to deacon. From there, it gets a little fishy, but I've heard two different accounts. There's like a lead deacon or proto deacon, yeah, yeah, who's yeah. the head of a parish, and then there's the archdeacon who uh, in our canon law, it sounds funny, but is like above the priests within the diocese because that, he's the uh, the eye of the bishop. That was, it was actually that way in the West originally as well. Um, so like the archdeacon of Rome uh -huh. was the, was the basically the boss of everybody, but the yes. Pope. And that's yeah. where like cardinals were originally archdeacons. That's hilarious. Nowadays, cardinals are bishops, but they they were originally archdeacons. So yeah, yeah, I taught yeah, I yeah. taught this actually to uh, one of my parishioners who's a kid. He's like ten years old, and I'm teaching him Amharic, but I'm also like sneaking in church stuff. And he was like, "Wow, there's a boss amongst the deacons." Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. He found it like he found it like blew his mind. And so, in, in, but even in like Russian Orthodoxy, like the 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 proto deacon of the bishop's cathedral is kind of also like he's like the whip basically. He's like, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, in our liturgy we have something called Bantak Adesat, which is the litany, which is read by the lead deacon during the liturgy. We literally pray for all of these positions. Right. But in fact, these positions don't exist. There is an argument that historically they did. I have not seen enough evidence that they actually did, so I mm. don't know. But there are a lot of moments throughout Ethiopian history which have these uh, existential crises. And one of the one that particularly is heinous to the church is this moment in the 1500s with the rise of a man called Grain Ahmed. Have you ever heard of him? No, this is later than my reading. It has okay, gotten so uh, no worries. Uh, Grain just means the left-handed one or the lefty. Oh. And uh, people argue about what his identity was from the evidence. I believe he was one of the former Aksumites who during a period of empire contraction was left in the south. And so he's a, a Harari, which is a man of the city uh, state right. of Harar, which was this strong Muslim a stronghold where my uh, paternal grandmother was born and raised, but mm. was uh, reconquered. Uh, Fully. I mean, it was always a tributary of Ethiopia, but conquered fully and incorporated during the scramble of Africa by Emperor Minelik. Okay. And, um, the, the, but this guy in the 1500s, when it was just a tributary, kind of had enough and made a full-on assault on Ethiopia with the Somali who were part of his militia. And then with the outside help of the Ottoman Turks, who for 300 years had our ports, which were in uh, modern day Eritrea. Um, and uh, the Yemeni as well. So he had Turks, Yemeni, Somali, and the people of Harar who are Semitic speakers. Um, and uh, obviously the Somali are Cushitic. And he led this army and destroyed almost all of Ethiopia for 11 years. Okay. It was with the help of uh, some uh, tricky uh, Portuguese Jesuits and potentially some Templar Knights that, God, we, def that we defeated it. them. No, I remember, I do remember reading, like when you mentioned the Jesuits and the, the the Knights, like I do remember reading about this, but from like a Western. Yes. But yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, Graham Hancock likes to focus uh, a lot on the Templar Knights aspect of it. But I, I do actually believe it was possible. They, they literally just sent like 400 soldiers with guns and that was enough. That was enough backup for us. And, and so in that, uh, moment, there's a book called Futa al Habasha where a Yemeni scribe of Gurang Ahmed kind of writes down all of the history in Arabic of what happens from their perspective. And it was a part one, the part two was never released because they were defeated. And it, it really talks about how he sold hundreds of people into slavery, destroyed massive churches and really destroyed almost like more than half of Ethiopia. So the fathers typically claim that it was after that destruction that they couldn't afford to, for example, the canon law says you must be 25 years old. Our deacons are typically eight and 10 year olds. So sometimes right, yeah, in special cases, 13 year olds. That's the thing that, that, that I was like, what? But then like, yeah. when, when I started, okay, they're not like deacon, deacon at that it, point. Well, it's it's confusing because it's this weird um, kind of, uh, we basically don't care about the du jour, 
and we're almost all on the de facto. Got it. So they should have like de jure title differences and practically they don't. And so, yeah, an eight year old kid could be the same as me, but they said we can't afford basically after Gurang Ahmed to ever let, and because, particularly because we had Coptic bishops, we can't afford to, uh, who didn't come that often and who themselves had a lot of scandalous histories. You know, sometimes there's a Muslim, sometimes they have concubines, a lot of strange things uh, yeah. that happened uh, between the relationship between Egypt and Ethiopia. But we can't afford to be so stringent in our requirements for deacons. So we need to get them as, as young as possible. And there's thing, um, it's not uh, stilettos. There's this weird word for what uh, people believe happened to Michael Jackson, uh, allegedly, which is that like the, you take these young boys and you basically turn them into eunuchs so that they could have the most beautiful voices. Uh, I forget. Uh, 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 castrat uh, Castrados, is that yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so like that, yeah. It, you know, obviously they're not eunuchizing people, so I don't want to say that, but there's yeah. this kind of related to that idea that the number one value, sadly, and I'm speaking de facto, the number one value that the Ethiopian church kind of had as a requirement for deacon wasn't like holiness, although sometimes, you know, it would be chastity. It was singing. It was singing yeah. the liturgy. Yeah. We're very much in the tradition of Ephraim the Syrian. There are people who've written about the connections between St. Yadid and St. Ephraim, where we never got engaged, really, although you can find some things in the scholastic Latin debates yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, how many... Uh, how many angels dance on the tip of yeah. a candle? I, I know that's a, a, a kind of a mis, a mischaracterization, yeah. but 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 we never got into that. Our view was we'll teach you poetry, we'll teach you to sing the liturgy, and we'll teach you the interpretation of scriptures. Yep. That's it. And that that's and and primarily the liturgies is like um there is respect for the scripture and the patristics but but really if if you want to be honest like what has captured the heart of most people is the liturgy uh, and, and not just the eucharistic liturgy but we have non-eucharistic liturgies which right yeah, from, yeah, yeah from 8 p.m to 5 a.m like yep. three to four times a month yep. um so like that is really captured the imaginations of the ethiopian people and particularly because uh, we had an empire that lasted longer than uh you know the greeks who were sacked by the by the turks and and really longer than anyone else in christendom from 300 ad technically we were sacked by the latins and then by the turks but anyway okay I'll, that, I'll, I'll i'll give it to not you not that we're salty you. or anything but. <laughs> I, I i'll give it to you but like yeah. from 300 ad to 1974 yeah we yeah. had a Christian empire. Yeah. And so that allowed us to have even more elaborations upon the kind of singing tradition yeah. than even our, our sister churches of uh, Alexandria and Antioch, uh, the Copts and the Syriac did. And so they just cared about little boys singing. And, yeah. and obviously as they get older, they do that. What yeah. they do instead of the de jour ranks of uh, filing deacon, which they don't distinguish between, you have eight-year-old archdeacons basically, oh, okay. is that when you get into your 20s and 30s, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm in my 30s and I'm married and I have a beautiful baby boy of about four months right now. Um, uh, amen. When, when you have, uh, and maybe I would hope to have as many as you one day, but when you get to your 20s and 30s, they kind of... Uh, pressure you because they don't trust you and they don't believe you and they say are you going to be a monk or are you going to be married and so first you need to figure that out and then you usually by your 20s and 30s will begin specializing either in literature or in uh, in like the biblical literature and uh, patristics or in some type of eucharistic liturgy or non-eucharistic liturgy or in the poetry uh, mm -hmm. tradition which i talked about with uh, jonathan Peugeot uh, for a bit yeah. and so once you do that if you finish, usually, if you finish uh, one of the traditional schools uh, of which they're all over Northern Ethiopia, you usually get a title. So for example, someone who finishes Kene uh, or the poetry becomes Magabe Mister, which means the patron or literally the feeder of mysteries. Oh, someone yeah. who uh, completes the New Testament is called Magabe Hadis, the feeder of the New Testament or the patron of the New Testament. Magabe Belui, the Old Testament, in uh, the liturgy, you're called just Kadasi Mamher or Mamher, which means professor of uh, Eucharistic liturgy. In Akwakwam um, and Digwa, which are the non Eucharistic liturgies, you're called Magabe Sabat, which is the feeder of glory, or Marigeta, which is the uh, choir master, like what's used in the Psalms. Yes. Some people are, are called Risadevr which means uh, head of the mountain, and mountain is a synonym for the church, because mm. many of our churches were 
were in the mountains. And, and yeah. sometimes Lik at Abbat, which means the um, the chief amongst the, the the wise ones, that actually used to be a title for people who made uh, handwork like blacksmithing and craftsmen and, and iconographers, but it, it later became used for the, the choir masters as well. Sorry for that lengthy response, but that's, no, that's, that's, the, super that's the explanation. Rad, that's really cool. Um, uh, yeah, um, I had so many thoughts and I've, lost track of a couple of them. about but, um, about the ranks of deacons or or which part oh or... no i was just thinking about um uh, so so uh so i'm a huge let's say devotee of cena from the syrian i've got his icon mm -hmm. right over here amazing and uh for for me like he's sort of like uh kind of like peak of church fathers for me yes. um I mean, and I really disciple Jacob of Saruk. Yeah, yeah. I really like I really like Jacob's stuff as well. And I, I that, you know, I love the Cappadocian Fathers. What I really love about Saint Ephraim is that he's kind of, uh, you know, he's living the same time as the Cappadocian Fathers, he's contemporary with them, and he's saying actually all the same things, but he's saying it in poetry, which, for me, um, and what I, uh, so for me, that's a more natural mode of of actually talking about these things. Um, and this is part of why when I talk in public. I talk about stories, but you'll never catch me doing apologetics. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, yeah the re, the, uh, <laughs> because that that sort of like discursive like debate kind of style. And I actually, you know, I took debate for a couple of years and me too. And and uh, you know, ha had a pretty thorough Western theological training, but it's just non intuitive to me. Um, and the thing that I I uh, kind of attribute this to is that although I didn't grow up in a liturgical tradition there was a huge emphasis placed on the daily reading of the Psalms. Um, and so I would get up every morning as a very young boy, you know, I'd get up at six or so in the morning. And before even, you know, the rest of the family was up, um, I'd get up and I would read the Psalms and basically like read through the Psalter every, sometimes every week, sometimes every month, but just like on a schedule would read through the Psalms. And so, and then also through Proverbs so that, you know, that parallelism, right that you get in semitic poetry and actually anglo-saxon poetry has something very very similar called apposition um where again you just restate the same thing but in like mm -hmm. in a kind of a slightly different way that actually sheds a little bit of of light on the thing that you're saying um but that that parallelistic uh, mode of poetry is uh for me that's that's kind of that's my native language right and so like coming across uh uh some of his beautiful long poems on the i mean i've got his full works right over there but um you know beautiful long poems on things like the annunciation the nativity of our lord and, and stuff like this and his long poems against Arius and, and all these different things i mean to me that's like this is this is like that that's my my preferred way to to kind of talk about these things um is to is to set them diverse and and you know nobody did it better than him so yeah i'm a huge fan I want to give you brotherly pushback and we'll see what you say. Um, like I said, I'm associated, I don't know if you know them as well, like Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, Father Mark Boulos, Dr. Richard Benton. Really. Um, so Father Paul was the longtime uh, decades uh, uh, Hebrew Bible teacher at um, St. Vlad's. And I'm actually taking a summer course beginning in a couple, uh, in a week or two with one of his uh, students as well. Funny. So that'll be fun. Yeah, um, It'll be my first uh, kind of formal theological training course and it'll be just Hebrew Bible uh, summer oh, course. They're very like no. I'll be doing program. I'll be doing um, Hebrew scriptures and the Psalms, especially with Father uh, 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 Bogdan Bokur, who who teaches the Psalms at Saint Vlad's. Yeah, amazing. I think yeah. this is a uh, Michael Legops Legospi, uh, Father uh, Michael Legospi, if I'm not mistaken, um, who grew up actually. You were mentioning Filipino martial arts. I think he grew up Filipino and Catholic, and then oh, and heard it. yeah. And by the way, we have a Filipino father-son duo the son is very famous on tiktok at toronto at the parish saint mary's cathedral where we have a bishop demetrius as well as the uh mother of the weekend the artist formerly known as the weekend now abel tesfai and he yeah, yeah 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 fifty thousand dollars to that parish so the father is a, a ethiopian orthodox priest and the son is an Ethiopian Orthodox deacon who sings in Amharic and he has the traditional instruments he's he's amazing they're they're, awesome. both, uh, they're both very amazing um uh, but um, what was I? <laughs> I'm losing my train of thought too. Push back but, about uh, something. Oh, the pushback. Thank you. So um, this kind of school that I'm in, and I asked Jonathan the same question, so I want to see how you respond. Um, sees a tension 
I would say we really like St. Basil's, let's say, liturgy and, and prayers and what he has to say about the poor. But like we're very uh, skeptical of what we would call heresy, like that all that should that all shall be saved, the apocastasis that DBH has been pushing lately. Yeah. And and that may be just a caricature of it. But do you see any tension between this um so that's this not and this uh, the Syriac and the Cappadocian fathers. It's not really Basil so much as a Saint Gregory. 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 No, I know and, it's Gregory, but he's yeah. one of the Cappadocians. So, so do you see any tension between Cappadocians and the Syriac? So, with some of that stuff, I feel like there's a lot of um, I feel like there are things that Saint Gregory of Nyssa said. And then mm -hmm. there are things that people said that he said. Oh, very good. And and uh, a, a lot, you know, not secondary even, rather than primary source. Not even so well, and not even so much like misquoting as in like quoting, but with a particular spin. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that we're really hampered by, especially dealing with this in English, is that almost all of like the translation of so 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 here's the thing. The Capito uh, of the Cappadocian Fathers, the two biggest ones are. Saint Gregory the Theologian and Saint Basil the Great. Um, you know, and obviously like a lot of Saint Gregory the Theologian stuff is like super essential, at least for us in the Greek church. Um, the you know, the the what is not assumed is not redeemed. The um, you know, the whoever does not acknowledge Mary as the Theotokos cuts himself off from the Trinity, the you know, things like this, right? Um uh, and then St. Basil, you know, as well, his work on the Holy Spirit, there's stuff on the Holy Trinity. Of the three of them, St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote the least and has been translated into English the most. Wow. Because his the the translations of his works, and I love St. Gregory of Nyssa, so I'm not maligning him. Um, it would be fruitless to do so. But the the people who translate him are basically, were mostly Anglicans of a certain liberal bent who are mm -hmm. looking for fuel for their sort of pet theological things. So actually they'll take things that were not really, let's say essential to St. Gregory's theology, mm -hmm. but then they'll, they'll make them into, here's a patristic case for this all shall be saved, which is certainly not what the scriptures teach, certainly not what the church teaches. Um, and not, I don't really think it's what St. Gregory of Nyssa believed either. Um, That's but, but, um, you know the 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 things that you know for me that are really essential in Saint Gregory of Nyssa are his his homilies on the Beatitudes and uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer, which are extraordinary. Um, his work on the life of Moses, which is extraordinary, and I think that's where you see the closest parody with Saint Ephraim, for instance, um, just the way that he reads the scriptures. Yeah, um, uh, as Joe said, the life of yeah, Moses and yeah, Gregory as well. Yeah. But the Beatitudes and the Lord Prayer are new to me. I'm definitely going to yeah, look yeah, at those. His homilies on those are really wonderful. And um, and, and there is uh, and then and then uh, you know his work on 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 humanity, which was really intended to be a uh, a sequel to Saint Basil's Hexameron. You know, since uh, Saint Basil didn't you know basically intended to keep going uh, on Genesis and then died before he could do so, and so his brother. His brother, who was uh, certainly gifted in a lot of ways, but not as pastoral as Saint Basil, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of picked up picked up the ball from him. But um, you know, the, I'll put it this way: there is a we have kind of a, a like a, a like a saint legend, you could say, like a hagiographical hagi legend. No idea if it happened, you know, in history. It doesn't really matter for these purposes. But uh, there's there's this legend that Saint Basil and Saint Ephraim met. Mm -hmm. you know, and like met and kissed, you know, like met and, and greeted each other yeah. during their lifetime. Of course, they certainly lived at the same time. It's not inconceivable that they would have met, yeah. but you know, like scholars will will differ on whether or not it happened. But the point of that legend is the church saying, is is the church saying these are uh, two voices, but it's the same gospel, right? And so that's so for me, I don't see a like a discontinuity between them. Uh, um, I'm not suspicious of the Cappadocians, but I am suspicious. Of people who want to like quote, you know, like cherry pick a few quotes from Saint Gregory mm -hmm. of Nyssa, and then say, "Oh, look, the Cappadocians believe dot dot dot." You yeah. know why? Because because 
you know, DBH or somebody else's, they're just trying to push it like a, a, a particular kind of a soapbox. And anytime somebody comes to this stuff, like whether it's scripture, whether it's the church fathers, whether it's ancient literature or whatever, whenever somebody comes to that with an agenda, I don't, I don't become suspicious of the sources. I become suspicious of the person who mm -hmm. now has this agenda, which is not part of the concerns of like, like you think the fourth century church was like, really like was having a debate about, you know, whether or not some people are going to be in hell. Like, mm -hmm. no, no, nobody in the fourth century was like arguing about that or doubting that, or like, you can take a couple of things that somebody wrote at some time and say, well, it seems like somebody might've had the idea, but that's not the same thing as saying, the church, you know, was was like that. This is a this is a concern of our time, right? This is a and and so when we take that and we try to force it backwards, it's like trying to read gender ideology into stories in the Bible or something yeah. like that. Like I'm like, you know, I I I just I'm very suspicious of people who go into this stuff with an agenda. So I don't know if that answers your question. Very um, much. No, you you did it early. Obviously, there are you know, the Cappadocian Fathers wrote a lot. Most of it still hasn't been translated into mm -hmm. English. I can read Greek, but only kind of. So, like, it'd be very slow going, especially for somebody like St. Gregory, Gregory the Theologian. Trying to go through him in Greek would be terrifying, I think. But, um, yeah. but, but, like, um, but I, but I do love them. And I, and I don't think, I don't think that they were really, like, out of sync with, like, let's say, for instance, St. Ephraim. I think it's more a case of um, us being out of sync with them. That's so. amazing. And the Ethiopian liturgy begins, although some people mistranslate it a lot. How terrifying is this day? Or more literally, how great is the terror of this day? And yeah. so I always like to remind people that that's the Eucharistic that's liturgy. Yeah. Beginning. <laughs> yeah, I some people it. translate it as how awesome is this day because they really want to they want a Vatican to it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but I yeah. always say how great is the terror of yeah. this day and how frightening is this hour in which the Holy Spirit is descending or coming down upon me and upon all of you as it comes down upon the elements, oh, no. the, the, the bread do and you, the wine. Do you guys use this? There's one of my favorite pieces of, I'm going to see if I can pull it up because I think I've got it right here in my notes, in my Evernote. Yeah. There's, nice. a, there's a Eucharistic hymn by Jacob of Serouge and it is, it's pretty much my favorite thing. We have a lot of his stuff, uh, even on Good yeah. Friday. We have like very lengthy, like we have even plays by him that uh, I've only uh, ever seen. The whole thing theory, between like, like the good thief and the chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to translate it one day because I've seen that the Syriac amazing. version is like 15 minutes and ours yeah. is like an hour. Oh. So what, what we typically do is, is so funny. Like we're very open-minded historically, but then people get narrow-minded later on is we take things from all over Christendom like Enoch and Jubilees, which probably we did in the medieval times, by the way. And then we expand, <laughs> we, we expand. So, we so, did expand. The, so did the Anglo-Saxons, by the way. Yeah, um, amazing. I did, I did a video with Jonathan about this, but um, there's a very strong case to be made that the author of the Beowulf poem had read Enoch amazing i did um, not I there's ever a lot of there's a lot of like sort of hidden not really hidden they're just like hidden yeah. to stupid modern scholars who are like can't see what's like aren't familiar enough with with eastern christianity to to know that actually some people do read enoch you know yeah and um uh there's uh uh anyway but so 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 it's been missed but now people are finally starting to notice it but there's a bunch of like sort of you know, even the name grendel grendel mm -hmm. That's that that ending L is not an Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. ending to a word. So here, here it is. This is the it's a, it's I just have it in my notes is the metrical homily of of uh, Jacob of Sarug. Um, but it's I think that I, I, I got it from like a Coptic source, but I think that they mm -hmm. use it during like when the clergy are taking communion. Um, OK, but it's uh, it's the Lord whom the seraphs fear to look at the same you behold in bread and wine on the altar. The lightning clothed hosts are burned if they see him in his brilliance, yet the contemptible dust partakes of him with confidence. The sun's mysteries are fire among the heavenly beings. Isaiah bears witness with us to have seen them. These mysteries which were in the divinity's bosom are distributed to Adam's children on the altar. The altar is fashioned like the cherubim's chariot and is surrounded by the heavenly hosts. On the altar is laid the body of God's son and Adam's children carry it solemnly in their hands. Instead of a man clad in linen stands the priest and distributes alms, that is the Eucharist, among the needy. If envy existed among the angels, the cherubim would have envied him. Where Zion set up a cross to crucify the sun, there grew up the tree that gave birth to the lamb. 
Where the nails were driven in the son's hands, there Isaac's hands were bound for an offering. Welcome, priests, who carries the mysteries of his Lord, and with his right hand distributes life to men. Welcome, priest, who carries a pure censer, and with its fragrance makes the world sweet and pleasant. Welcome, priest, whom the Holy Spirit did raise up, and on his tongue bears the keys to the house of God. Welcome, priest, who binds man in the depth below, and the Lord binds him in heaven on high. Alleluia. Welcome, priest, who binds men on earth, who unbinds men on earth, and the Lord unbinds him in the highest. Kyrie eleison. Praise be to the Lord, his mercy upon you, and absolution for me. I mean, that's so beautiful. We don't have that exact prayer I would have known, and definitely not at that time. At the yeah. time, we have other prayers going on. Um, I, but think, I think I got this. I said, I said Coptic, but I, it's, it's Syriac. It's, it's, it's Syriac? The, it's okay. Syriac. Well, we have both Coptic and Syriac yeah. influences. Yeah. Ethiopia is a mutt, I will say, in that yeah, regard, in the way that we take Syriac. Hey, well, even, even, our, even our Greek, right? This is the other thing I was going to mention. Even our Greek, yeah. right? I'm studying uh, the... So I'm in a... I'm in a vocations program through my diocese and we'll see nice. what happens out of that. But uh, even in the Greek rite, um, like the rite that we actually have is really a combination of the, of the, um, the what's sometimes called the asthmatic rite of Constantinople, which is, mm -hmm. in other words, nothing is said, which is not sung. So everything is sung all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the monastic rite of Jerusalem, of yes. the, the Hagiopolite. So even what we have is not even so much like a Greek rite as is like a sort mm -hmm. of a Hagiopolite plus Constantinopolitan. And basically all of the priest parts are from the Constantinopolitan rite and all of the people's parts are from the monastic uh, Hagiopolite rite. So even even then, like, and I think that's where like a lot of the Semitic heart in, in our liturgy yes. like, comes, comes from the Holy City in that way. Father Mark, whose uh, father was Coptic, but mother uh, Palestinian and mm -hmm. Father Paul, who is Palestinian, they have told me that and, and father mark was a student of father mayendorf at saint vlad's yeah, 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 yeah. and he, he told me that uh a while ago and and they both favor yeah. the the kind of the palestinian jerusalem monastic right because it's also very psalms oriented yeah. which is why i i just absolutely loved the fact that you said you grew up doing that even as a baptist yeah. and um as i've explained many times to people the the system of even how you come to read and write in Ethiopia traditionally goes through yeah. that. So my father oh, went through beautiful. that system. He learned how to read and write by having to recite out loud the Psalms in three different tones in Giz. And wow. that's our version of kindergarten. Amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> um, I've got a Giz uh, grammar over here and I've been, I've amazing. been tooling around with it a little bit, but uh, I'll have to hit you up with uh, questions. Please. I, yeah. I would, uh, I, yeah. I would I would love that. And on that on that topic, you mentioned the universal history earlier. Could you yeah. tell the audience what your universal history series was and uh, why did you spend so much time on Ethiopia? I had many Ethiopians yeah. sending it to me yeah, 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 before yeah, yeah. you even reached out. And they're and, like, these guys are talking about Ethiopia. Yeah. And obviously I got some things wrong, uh, but I hope the love was evident. Um, yes, yeah, it so was. The it universal was. history series is a, is a series I started doing two years ago now with Jonathan Pajot. And we're still doing it. Um, we still do like about one video a month or so. Uh, so it's a pretty big back catalog. Uh, actually, the most recent one, we kind of do like a reframing of the whole project. So people are curious, like just go watch the most recent video. It's called The Symbolism of Nationalism. Um, that's, that's a good kind of like understanding what do we mean by universal history. But basically, it's the idea that civilizations, when they convert to Christianity, that they have to write themselves into... Um, they have to write themselves into the Christian story. And then to some extent, they also have to write themselves into like the Greco-Roman story. Um, but the reason that I liked uh, Ethiopia, and this is why we did like our first four or five episodes on Ethiopia, Amazing. is because it's outside the empire. Yes. Right? It was outside the empire. So outside it's, the Roman empire. Yeah, yeah, outside the Roman empire. And so because of that, um, there's a... Uh, it's, it's, like a, it's like the best proof case for what we're talking about. Because there, there's a there's a blend, and a lot of the I won't say this is the only kind of person that I'm talking to when I'm doing these things, but I always have in mind like who's the person who wants to argue with me, and uh, not because I'm doing apologetics, but because I want to like, well, like I want to tell a story that they need to hear, right? And so for me, it's the it's the when I was growing up, like, um, and actually when I went to seminary, Protestant seminary, right? Constantine is the big bad guy. Yeah, yeah, he's the big he's the big satan you know in yeah. the story of christianity like christianity was this 
perfect Baptist thing, right? Like I literally, there's something called landmarkism or Baptist secessionism. And it's the uh, belief that the church at Jerusalem in AD 33 was a Baptist church. Yeah. <laughs> with a, with a, with a congr I, you're laughing, but I grew up with people who believe this. Right? I went so, to college with them, the Church of yeah. Christ people, part of the American. Yeah. So uh, the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ is like, uh, um, so landmarkism was created as a response to Church of Christ because mm -hmm. what Church of Christ believed was the early church looked like this. Yeah. And then Constantine came along and ruined it. And mm -hmm. there have been no Christians until like the 19, yeah. whatever, right? Their website so, says their church starts in 33 AD. Right, the only right. thing I tip my hat to them for is that they their services are a cappella. Yeah, yeah. I, I I do love that they that they have a cappella services. Um yeah, I, I've got a lot of former Church of Christ friends who are not Orthodox, actually. Uh, so we talk about this a lot. But the Baptists, like, so, so, uh, but that that was part of the Campbell movement. And mm -hmm. the Campbell movement uh, basically kicked off in, like, Tennessee, Kentucky area, which was all Baptist before that. So the Baptists needed a response to this claim because what the Campbellites were saying wasn't just that the Catholics have never been real Christians. They're saying, actually, also the Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, you guys are also not Christians. Um, cause we're, we're the, the church has been missing until us, right. Mm -hmm. Which is a very American thing. Like that's, you can always tell it's an American religion because the same thing with like Mormonism, right. Is, which is like the premier American religion. It's the idea that the church has been missing until me. I'm like, and I'm the one, I'm the one that's going to solve everything. So, uh, so the Baptists needed to respond to this. So they came up with something called landmarkism. And the idea of landmarkism is that not only was the first church in Jerusalem Baptist, but coming forward through time, they, they took all of these heretical groups like the Donatists, for instance, or the, the Manichaeans or the uh, uh, Macedonians or like these other like various heretical sects over the course of the, the history of the church. And they said, actually, that's just Catholic propaganda. These churches were really Baptist. And so that's how they have this unbroken. So it's like a Baptist version of apostolic succession, basically, <laughs> um, which is pretty wild. It's pretty wild. So uh, anyway, the the I don't even remember where I was going before. We were that. talking about you were before that. We were talking about why you wanted to have as not an apologetics. Maybe what I would describe yeah, 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 as yeah, like yeah, yeah. teaching or pedagogy. Yeah, yeah. So why that's, you're that's trying a good to, way like, to put it. So the reason yeah. that I so so the person that I have in mind, you know, among other things, is the person who's like, oh, well, Christianity was just this perfectly Baptist thing. No icons, no Eucharist, no altar, no sacrifice, no liturgy. Just it was just people getting together and singing some psalm songs and then hearing sermon. And it was a congregational policy and all this stuff until Constantine came along and then forced everyone in the Roman Empire to paganize Christianity. Uh, which, which is, of course, not the case. It doesn't hold up to even the littlest bit of historical scrutiny. But I like Ethiopia as a great example because it was outside of the empire, right? The Roman Empire, right? You guys had your own empire, right? So it's outside of that. And it's this wonderful witness to like the quality of early apostolic Christianity, right? And this is why, I mean, you know, because of the Chalcedon thing, technically we should be closer to Rome in terms of mm -hmm. our theology, right? But then like, if I go to a Roman mass, especially like a post-Vatican II Roman mass, like it feels like a Protestant service that I grew up in, right? But if I go to like a Coptic service, that's obviously Orthodox, right? You know, in, you know and I'm, I'm nobody's bishop, so I don't have yes. to, I don't have to like <laughs> anathematize anybody or anything like this. But I'm just saying like one of these things feels like where I go to church, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, it's not like a Vatican. I mean, we've been to, I've been to two Vatican II masses since I became Orthodox and um, uh, went to one of them with my wife uh, who'd, ne who'd never been to a mass before. Um, and she was just like, now I'm mad. Like she, she was like, she was like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the story of my wife's family is a Roman Catholic family, but her parent, her, her dad converted to, to being a Baptist basically mm -hmm. or Bible church or whatever. Anyway, just like some Protestant group. And so, um, so like she'd grown up, she'd grown up hearing like all these horror stories about the Catholic church, but had never been to a mass. So this was like our first one. And this is after we've been Orthodox for several years and it was a funeral for a family member. And uh, we went and of course we went to just, you know, pray for the family member and everything else. But then like we're leaving and she's like, I'm, she was like actually upset that 
this was the thing like it was so close to a protestant service like with a with the exception of like they gave communion at the end you know uh there's no difference and and like and they use protestant hymns and everything else so anyway i'm not trying to rag on people but because it's not not what i want to do but my my point is my point is that there's like a uh uh there are like theological differences but there's also like the question of praxis right mm -hmm. you, you said like you're almost entirely de facto right well like yeah. de facto one of these things is not like the other mm -hmm. so yeah yeah and, and i think that gets to the heart you know um in his magnum opus the rise of scripture the father paul nadim tarazi says uh you know controversially but i love it he says that chalcedon is the saddest moment in church history and there's you know the type of uh people that you are com in communion with who are like oh why are you hanging out with those silly monophysites you know and refuse to use our own terminology of miaphysites and you know there's people on my side who will argue to death about the miaphysite christology and right, uh, yeah. if, you, if you push me and ask me i i do think and i had a uh, choice i really did have a choice and an option and i knew about uh I, I left the church for about 10 years i never converted to anything else but i just didn't go to church and i had an option before me in my early adulthood when i graduated college i could have like gone to some english-speaking antiochian church and it would have been oh, much yeah. easier i spoke amharic but i'd had zero good as knowledge and mm -hmm. i i chose the harder route of doing that because uh, a little bit of a head nod to, I do think the kind of uh, more country, more simple uh, Christology that we had was more right in a sense, but I don't view the other one as wrong. I just view it yeah. as an argument I don't want to have. And I'm so much more interested in like the de facto, like let's let's pray our liturgies. Let's pray the Psalms together in our in our different, uh, you know, right. let me do the Jerusalemite uh, psalmody and let me do right. the Coptic yeah. psalmody. Let's do the Syriac yeah. psalmody, the psalmody. I want to hear all the psalmodies. You right. know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. and, that's and the and heavenly like, temple. The flip side is that I'm uh, like, you know, again, like if I had to like, you know, okay, gun to my head, I certainly like the, the Chalcedonian like statement. I fully, you know, believe, confess, et cetera, right? But I've been to lots of pan-Orthodox um, uh, events with the cops in our area. So we have a very large Coptic presence here in North Texas. Um, actually, also a lot of um, a lot of uh, Eritrean folks as well. And actually, actually, several Eritrean members of my parish, uh, because our old uh, uh, our old Archbishop, Archbishop Dimitri, um, at the time. The, the the Eritreans who came to who came to Dallas, right? Uh, they had no church, mm -hmm. and so they just came to Vladika Dimitri, and and like th their babies needed to be baptized, and so they yeah. just so they just they received them by confession and baptized babies, and amazing, and a, a lot of them just still come because this is where you know you know somebody loved them, you know. But also, there's a very large you know. Eventually, they built their own church. There's a large Eritrean. Uh, presence here you know so they have their own uh, their own church here on the north side of town but er every once in a while i'll bump into somebody that's eritrean and and they'll come up to me and they'll say are you orthodox um you know uh well, because they maybe they saw me cross myself over my food or you know just like you know well he's got a beard there's a good chance i don't know <laughs> um i don't nice know beard. but nice beard. yeah 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 but anyway so they'll come at, are you orthodox but yes and so we'll just start talking about things and in all of these interactions I, there has never been a sense that we're we're more Christian than you are, like on either side. Nobody's acted that way, um, which is to everybody's credit. It's to everybody's credit. So yeah, I'm you know again, um, uh, you know my my own Archbishop Archbishop Alexander. Um, he um, I was at a church uh, uh, like the dedication of a new church, and um, he was there, and uh, the Armenian uh, Archbishop for North America, uh, Daniel uh but it was right before his consecration so he was like i think just a monk at the time or something but anyway he was in town so he came to the consecration like the church consecration and um uh obviously nobody invited him up to like con celebrate the liturgy or anything like that everybody calmed down but <laughs> he was in of course he's in there with his aide and they're both wearing the pointed armenian you know monk cowl mm -hmm. armenians definitely i think have the most based vestments of any tradition like, uh, like, yeah, they're pretty, pretty sweet, but, um, yeah. So, so he's in there and, and of course he, he comes in and introduces himself. And, and so somebody goes, tells Vladika Alexander, who is uh, of Armenian heritage on his mother's side, I think. But anyway, 
So he came out and they 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 embraced and they kissed and we brought out a very special chair for the Armenian bishop to sit in while the service was going on. And then afterwards we all had lunch together and it was really lovely. And the the two bishops sat together and just like, you know, so I, I'm the kind of person that uh, like, I don't want to treat my ancestors like they were idiots. And so mm -hmm. I'm not into saying, oh, it was just a linguistic misunderstanding and they were all too stupid, but we're smart. And so we know I'm not, I'm not going to be that guy, but also like, you know, again, uh, the nice, you know, I'm just, who, who am I? I'm a layman and I don't need to, um, I don't need to like go around like anathematizing people and you know like you can you can tell like the 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 liturgical mindset right the 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 praxis the fasting right that 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 you that we have in the east you know that's that we still have in the east the like all these different things like the, the it would be insane to look at like the coptic church and the martyrs that they've had over the, just the last century right and be like oh those guys aren't really christians like come on come on yeah and and to to be uh, entirely fair i do not know anybody who's ever said that um now i've found people online but online people aren't real people you know you know <laughs> but like like i've never i've never really met anybody who who was like really just like super agitated about this like so that's fair, and uh, uh, I, I I love it. And the prefaces are are needed just because we're being so public, uh, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. A, a private chat, but um, you are a layman. I'll give it to you, but I will say uh, you're a layman maybe who hides his power level like they did in the Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> and your power level, your to 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 let the listeners know how much your power level is. You've surpassed even me by your reading of the Ethiopian Synexarium. Can you talk about? what your experience was like reading the lives of now obviously i've heard it in church a lot of times but yeah. cover to cover i've never read the full ethiopian synexarium can you talk about reading the lives of the saints from ethiopia and yeah. um the the byzantine prophecy that you talked about as well oh right yeah um so the the I mean, as far as the synexarium goes uh, i think synexarium is what is is for you guys um uh uh i mean for so i can't get enough of hagiography um, because hagiography, it's like, it's the kind of thing where like, it's legendary material, but it's also true, right? I mean, all legends are true to some extent. That's why they're legends. But like, this is like, this is a legend also, but it's a legend about a person you could pray to, right? You know, so, um, um, so I, I can't get enough of hagiography. We read the, uh, the Simono, Simonos Petras, uh, 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 important Athenite monastery that my, my own sort of spiritual heritage is tied to. Um, but there's a they have like really the best synexarian going right now in terms of like and there's a really good english translation of it so we we read that with the kids every day but uh yeah when i was researching ethiopian christianity uh like for me like if i want to know what is your faith about what's your country about what are your people about i want to know like who are your saints and this is this is a key idea of universal history is that everybody has saints even protestants have saints right they don't call them saints but everybody has saints like you can't get away from the idea that there's hierarchy and veneration this is just the way that the world lays itself out and so um so yeah um reading through it i mean it's been a couple of years now since i undertook the project but uh i was just um really struck by something that i've noticed in the sort of like north african christianity and then in irish christianity and there are people by the way this is one of the things i thought about saying a minute ago but i forgot there are people who who try to draw some lines between uh, like Celtic Christianity, like uh, uh, Hibernic Christianity, and then Coptic Christianity, um, and I don't think it's unfounded. Like I don't think it explains the whole picture, but there's definitely something to that. Um, and uh, so something that I kind of noticed about both of those strains of Christianity, like reading the lives of the Irish and Welsh Welsh saints, um, there's there's basically a period in the history of of the church in what is now like the British Isles, uh, that that you could have just referred to it as the Irish Church, because because all of the Christianity in that part of the world was basically just an Irish mission, um, and um, uh, but so something that I noticed like reading the lives of those saints and then reading the lives of the Ethiopian saints uh, is that there's there um, there are a lot of these very extreme characters like extreme characters. Uh, being a being a being a monastic is an extreme action, right? But there are different ways of like different modes of being a monastic. Lots of monastics who like lived in the city or live, but but like these extreme characters who would go out and find like the least likely place, 
right? The most dangerous place, the most extreme place. Lots of encounters. Uh, one of the you know really recurring uh, theme is like encounters with demonic monsters in the wilderness, right? And uh, in in Ireland, because they have lots of water, it's always water monsters, which is also mm -hmm. a particularly Indo-European uh, problem, by the way. Um, it, whereas in Ethiopia, it's like the creatures that you run into in the desert, right? Um, in, in these really extreme places. Um, uh, and then also just the, the you know, the, the focus on the ascetic feats, um, on, you know, like, you know, praying until your legs fall off and, you know, things like this. And, uh, but, but that sort of constant, and, and it's not to say that those characters aren't in the Byzantine Synaxarium because they are um, actually a lot of the same people, obviously, um, but also um, a lot of that goes back to like originally like the Egyptian desert tradition. But I think there is something about, um, and I hope this isn't just like exoticism as somebody like from the outside, but there's something about Ethiopian Christianity that's sort of like, you know, we talked a lot about Ethiopia as the edge, as the container. I like the 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 I like the um the the idea of the nest, right? The the nest a nest is something that's made of like leftover parts of all these things. You talked about Ethiopia being kind of a mutt, mm -hmm. you know. It, a nest is something that's made of leftover parts of all of these things, but it actually becomes a container for life, right? And to me, that's kind of what Ethiopian Christianity is, um, and like all of your connection to uh, ancient ancient Judaism, and um, you know, there's, you know, almost certainly like a whole extra kind of Judaism in Ethiopia that's parallel what's happening in Palestine, you know, during the, the Iron Age, right? Um, but your connection to ancient, ancient Judaism, your connection to the Ark of the Covenant, all that stuff, I think is all kind of part of that picture. And that's, to me, that's why I love it so much. Like, it's like, because it kind of collects all these things. And again, that's why we started there is because it's a, um, it's just a crazy place to begin look at universal history because it's like here's a thing that's beyond the roman empire and it's kind of literally you know in the scriptures it's the end of the world right so it's the end of the world and this is where all these things collect but it's like really important things and so again to me this is it's just a really important witness to the character of ancient apostolic the ancient apostolic faith yeah, I want to thank you so much for that series. As I can tell you this as an ordained minister in the Ethiopian church, that I will thank you on behalf of our church. I'm the type of person I, I was telling you earlier through kind of direct message that I'm a, a wabi-sabi believer, this Japanese concept, yeah. surprise, surprise. Like I believe in the imperfection. I don't mind if you got some things sloppily wrong. Frankly, there are a lot of our people who get things sloppily wrong. Yeah. Like I, I don't want to talk about it here, but I've been on other like Catholic shows and other Orthodox shows where people love asking me about the Immaculate Conception. I could tell you it's for me, like the least interesting subject ever. Um, we, 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 we were poking fun at some of the tricky Anglicans earlier, but they're some of my favorite people ever in history were Anglicans. C.S. Lewis, sure, yeah. who we mentioned, is Anglican. Yeah. M.T. Wright is still alive and amazing, and I, I've learned so much from him. He's Anglican. Uh, the premier Syriac scholar in the world, Sebastian Brack, uh, right. Brock, is Anglican, right, yeah. the premier Ethiopianist in the world. He just passed away a couple of years ago. He ended his life and as an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian and was given full funerary rites in our church. Richard Pankhurst, though, was like by far the, the clear, the clear Ethiopianist, and he grew up, uh, you know, Anglican. So uh, I'm, I'm mostly know, just I, disappointed that you're getting questions about the Immaculate Conception rather than like Jacob Marley. <laughs> or Bob that, Bob Marley, Jacob Marley yeah. screwed. Bob Marley, yeah. like I would have expected, that would be the thing you get all the questions about. I would much rather talk about Bob Marley because then I get to talk about Abu <laughs> Isaac, who was his uh, the one who baptized him and thousands yeah. of other Caribbeans. And Abu Isaac brought into the priesthood uh, my father confessor, Father Thomas Finley, who uh, grew up Catholic and Baptist, mm. was a unordained reader in the Russian Orthodox Church of Dallas for 30 years, I believe mm. under Archbishop Dimitri, I could get that name wrong. And then uh, that, when he just- that's, Yeah, that's the, um, that's the, uh, that's, that's the founder of our diocese, yeah. Yeah, so he was an un unordained reader mm. for 30 years on his way to being a monastic until he ran into this taxi driving married ethiopian priest who convinced him to to come on over after some wow Ethiopian wow food. wow, wow. <laughs> uh, uh, and not that again he ever hates the russian tradition and i hate sure, even yeah. like talking about that as conversion like it's really like you know confession and chrismation is what people yeah. um 
uh, normally do when they're when they're switching yeah, 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 yeah. back and forth and those things. But yeah, I want to thank you on behalf of that. I I enjoy that. And and like I said, like our own side is kind of sloppy how they present it. I like to consider myself the kind of uh, greatest English language Sherpa, even if I don't know the most, I'm the greatest English language <laughs> Sherpa or or tour guide of our of our tradition. I love it. A lot, of, a lot of other people kind of misrepresent us, so I'm, I absolutely want to shower you in in gratitude for doing that. And um, one of the things that has happened, I don't want to get you to to be the geopolitical commentator, but in the I know the war impacts uh, the Orthodox Church, obviously between yeah. Russia and the Ukraine, and very, one of the, in a very personal way for a lot of people in our parish. Uh, many of the people in our parish were uh, refugees, like from the KJB, wow. KGB, and that's that's why there's that mostly Ukrainians and some Russians that that started that parish in Dallas, where I attend now. So, like, so Amazing. the whole, everything happening is, I mean, it's very complex, but it's very it's raw direct. for a lot of us. Yeah, but part of that kind of an adjacent part of that conversation I've seen, and this gets to the Byzantine prophecy that you guys talked about as yeah. well, is this question of who is the heir or the successor to Rome? Oh, sure, we see yeah. this movement from uh, Western Europe to West Asia and Eastern Europe meeting, right, with Byzantium. And then from there, it's like people, there are people who say Moscow and the people who are seeking it. And, you know, even some people are like, you know, let's take back uh, Hagia Sophia with the Russians, you know? Yeah, like there, yeah, there, yeah, there, yeah. There's that kind of, uh narrative out there but you guys kind of talk about this visiting prophecy which may be counterintuitively like there's this afro-asiatic or black rome a little south yeah so there's this um there's this prophecy this is in the uh the apocalypse of pseudo methodius which is written a little bit after chalcedon but like still when it's still pretty fresh on everybody's mind and uh but it's it's kind of written in response to like the arab invasion of of the levant basically but um in this prophecy, um, uh, there's basically this this uh, this idea that um, there there's a like a sort of like a secret son of the Roman emperor or something like that that's sent away, um, and that this union happens at Chalcedon, um, and that son is sort of sent away into Ethiopia, and the, it's the idea that at the end of time the last Roman emperor will come out of Ethiopia, and there will be like this final restoration of Christianity. Uh, that will immediately precursor the coming of the Antichrist. And then the, the last Roman emperor will uh, basically, uh, uh, he'll give up the kingdom to God. The, 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 the true cross will ascend back into heaven. And then uh, Christ will return to defeat the Antichrist. And this is beautiful kind of a prophecy, but kind of wrapped up all, in all of that is this sort of hope of reconciliation of Christianity, of this, you know, the schism that started at, Cal at Chalcedon that it, that it's going to, that'll also be the place where it c comes back together in some way. Um, so yeah, it's, so that's the, uh, we, the, we did like a whole video about this and about the whole, the whole idea of like the return of the King, which most cultures have this, you know, like uh, pretty much every culture has like a semi mythic emperor or King or like figure who's going to come back right at the end of time and route, route our enemies. So yeah, there's one, yeah, there's one, um, there's a famous emperor, Theodore of Abyssinia and, yep. um, uh, we we have we have the Greeks have the marble emperor, and the uh, the you know the Danes have um, uh, um, uh, um, what's his name Harold of Norway, and the the English have King Arthur, and and so on. So yeah, yeah, and there's there are current really Ethiopian well prophecies. Yeah, there are current Ethiopian prophecies that there will be another Theodore of Abyssinia, and some of the the more uh, let's say strict preachers are very against it, but like the people, uh, cause we've been facing kind of 50 years of decline because of communism and yeah. uh, being a federal democracy, which is just being a lapdog of the American, uh, you know, yeah. empire. And there's a um, whole civil war going on right now. Yes, it's it, 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 the hot yeah. war ended and uh, now it's kind of a, a cold war and the sides have switched a few times. It's all very yeah. confusing. I, uh, I had a very hard time following it as an outsider. I'm like, I don't really know what's going on at this point. Yeah, um, there's a lot going on there. Originally, the it was kind of uh, um, all of Ethiopia versus the separatist Tigray, but now uh, after 600,000 lives lost, uh, which uh, you know some people make comparisons to how much ha spotlight this gets gets versus the the hot war in Europe uh, yep. in yep. terms of just sheer lives, if if magnitude is is one of your values. And uh, now sides have kind of switched where the kind of Tigrayan leadership is now with the the main PM who comes from a Roromo background. And they, they seem to be posturing against 
the Amhara. It's all very uh, strange. The Eritrean leader who's very much involved just had a four day, like unheard of uh, prior to this four day meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin and with uh, President Xi as well. And it's funny because there are pictures of like when when Putin meets with like other leaders, they have this super long table. Yep. When he met with the Eritrean leader, they were like right next to each other. Yeah. And uh, they even uh, took him. You know, they say he he might not be a believer, the Eritrean president, but they they took him into the giant Russian military cathedral, if you know it. And he yep. him along with other Eritreans who are very obviously at least culturally orthodox were like doing like a uh, tours of the icons and of the cathedral. So very very kind of uh, funny uh, orthodox. Uh, things going on there um but you know what you you've given me uh, a huge generous amount of your time today so i'm i'm very uh, appreciative of that and uh you know again you underestimate your own power level because you have clearly so much life and vitality to be able to do these uh lengthy podcasts i just wanted to mention earlier when you're saying every culture has its own martial arts we never really had kind of formal ones and they kind of uh, mm. uh they, they went away but in in some parts of northern ethiopia there was a headbutting exclusive art which might give the left way people in myanmar and burma a run for their money in the south they had some stick fighting but my own archbishop the archbishop barnabas of southern california said that when he was a young monk uh, I think he was a hierodeacon at the time, he, but he even became a, a full like hiero monk at like 13 or 14. Him and the, the the monk boys in this kind of exclusive male environment used to play a game they called the Teloch, which is who can make who fall. So they didn't do any ground grappling, but he he showed me and he actually like grabbed me and showed me because he saw me in my jujitsu uniform. Oh, like, yeah. Visiting church. He's like, oh, I used to do that too. And he's like showing me like how they had underhooks and overhooks and they yeah. used to try to get people to uh, to fall to the ground. So I wanted to give you an opportunity um if you wanted to to plug your mma rule set and then to plug yes. everything you do because you do so many great things and i want everyone in my audience to support this man who gives us such great content everywhere for free uh so tell them everywhere they can follow you support you and then any mma rule set so uh if so the kickstarter is over but if you go to strangeowlgames.com um, there is a Patreon you can subscribe to if you want to just read poetry that I write and languages that I invent and fantasy stories that I write and tabletop RPG adventures. You can subscribe to that Patreon. We have uh, a big release every month. So that's the best way. Like if you want to follow my stuff and also get notified when uh, when the book will be when, when the the books will be available. They'll be available pretty much like in any bookstore, uh, hopefully. So um, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Richard Roland. Um, and uh, 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 I do have a short book of like poetry and fantasy uh, stuff, which is more like legendary myths and such. Here's a paperback version of it right here. Um, you can't see it, but my office is just piles of books all the way around. Um, uh, this is called the Akborida. This is set in the same fantasy world that the role playing game is coming out in. You can get this at darklybrightpress.com. Um, and I think there's uh, it's sold out a couple of times now, but there's a few more copies if people want to check that out. Um, I don't know what else. Um, there's, I do have a YouTube channel. It's just Richard Roland on YouTube, uh, where I'm mostly doing, uh, fantasy gaming stuff right now. So if people want to, want to follow me there, they can. And, uh, as far as MMA rule sets go, I think that almost all the problems that we're experiencing in the UFC right now would be solved if we just went to the pride format. So pride rules, which would mean that Algermain Sterling, who fair play to him, he's playing the rule set that he has. He's a fantastic martial artist. But like this whole like stalling with a hand on the floor so nobody can kick me in the face, that's dumb. And uh, if you brought back the, if, if we switched to the pride rules, that would fix that. The other thing pride would fix, people don't always know this, but uh, pride uh, prioritized finishes by doing a 10 minute round. So you had one 10 minute round to try to get a finish in. And then if you nobody got finished in that first 10 minute round, then they would start going to successive five minute rounds. And if you do this, you don't even need judges because you can just do five minute rounds until somebody falls over, right? Um, and then Pride also had yellow cards, which is basically if somebody was stalling a bunch, the ref could flag them with a yellow card, which mean they would lose like a certain percentage of their purse. Um, and so this is a way of keeping fights fun, uh, exciting, fast moving, but also prioritizing finishes. And holy cow, if you go back and watch some of those old Pride fights, I was a huge Fedor fan. I'm still a huge Fedor fan like um the like the just like the number of finishes and the the like the non-stop action um and also the walkouts were just so much better 
so much better. So anyway, that's my that's my 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 pitch for. I like the UFC, but they should switch to a Pride round format and would solve a lot of the and and then also Pride rules. And I think it would solve a lot of the problems that we have right now. So. I absolutely agree with all the points you said. I'll point out that Ryzen today, which is kind of a yes. successor to Pride, does have those length. And my former uh, teacher, Crone Gracie, his some of his frustrations in the UFC are the five-minute rounds, whereas Ryzen, he was fighting 10-minute uh, rounds. I know he's fighting better guys as well, but that's yeah. a lot of people talk smack about him online. I think that's part of he had the a dynamic. Rough, he had a rough go this last, his last outing. He did. It's, it you know what, it's... It's the gloves, the wraps, and the round lengths, I would say. But another thing that they do is they don't just narrowly have this weird like boxing system that they that maybe even boxers shouldn't have that they adopted where you, you count up all the rounds as like yeah, yeah, separate yeah. siloed entities as opposed to looking at it in a universal way, the way well, that you do as that's a totality. The funny thing is that it's really like three fights. Yes. You're, you're fighting three fights. And yeah. then like doing best two out of three, basically. That's which is exactly. which is a little is a little weird to me. And then also like the other thing that really irritates me with the current round format is that you can have somebody who's knocking somebody else's block off for four and a half minutes, and yes. then in the last thirty seconds, the other guy gets on top and he's in a dominant position and he's threatening a submission. Well, who won that round? Well, if you're yeah. going by time, it was the guy that was dominating the cage. But who was who was winning at the end of the fight? Right. That's exactly. that's only the moment. That's the that's the only moment that really matters. So anyway, that's the quintessential fight for me is a, and like you said, I'll do props to him using the current uh, rule set. I won't, yeah. you know, argue otherwise. I'm arguing about normative, not descriptive right. stuff. Leon Edwards, the current a champ at 170, right. on his way up, fought Gunnar Nelson, and Gunnar Nelson in the in the past, like in the last minute of their final round, absolutely outclassed him. He had him a mount and was wailing on him. Yeah. But Leon Edwards was literally just wrapping him up in double underhooks from yep. the bottom of mount and holding on for his dear life right. and somehow gets to continue on which is well, absolutely unreal uh, but also ridiculous. like the first the first uh peter yana aldermaine sterling fight another good example of like yes. somebody is clearly winning and then because of like this stupid rule because he, sterling had one hand on the yeah. ground you know he so. baited him he clearly to me he clearly baited him and he did it our, he did it in his cejudo fight too like he kept yeah. like i like, saw that yeah I yeah. saw him betting and and for us who love words, it was amazing to see the retired uh, Habib Nurma Gamedov from the audience giving us live language interpretation. Yes. And then the, the people heard him say that because he's like a famous fighter. And they realized that the like he actually turned to his coach and was like, yo, can I hit him in the face? And the coach was like, yeah, hit him in the face. Yep. <laughs> and that's how he got uh, in trouble and ended it. But yeah, I absolutely want to say, Danke, Richard. Thank you so much for doing the program. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, this will be one for the books, dude. Like It's like a three-hour conversation. Should keep people busy for a couple of weeks.